I stream too. But yeah, cheers, bro. Yeah, cool. I just did a uh, webcam. It'll, it's through the uh, live feed or whatever. Oh, okay, then yeah, I'll go uh, share it on the on the stream then. I'll make it large. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> yep, it's good to go. All right, all right, cool. All right, hello and welcome. This is the history of E equals MC squared and the philosophical implications, according to Shane, um, and, the, and the significance of, uh, of, what that, of what that actually means, right? Because we're all told a, uh, a story about E equals MC squared. And uh, let's see, one second. Oops, just changed the wrong scene. Okay. All right, so on the history of E equals MC squared. So we've all been this guy before. E equals MC squared is physically made itself because it was utilized to create atomic bombs or some variation of something like that. Like we've all said something like that, right? We've all been that guy. So this is going to be the history of that relationship of e equals MC squared and charge mass relationships and uh, and that sort of stuff. So we're going to go over the uh, the basic history of it first. So starting with your boy Hassel Norrell in 1904, he was doing experiments with a closed sphere and he was heating it up and he found that the kinetic energy of that um, gate, that that pressure gave an apparent weight or mass to it. And he came up with a coefficient to calculate it. Um, which he later changed, I uh, have it reduced down. But anyway, this is just uh, one of the, the early iterations of the charge mass relationship. And of course, there was some other people before them. Uh, I think Punk here had one as two, but I just found out about that one today, so I don't have it fully incorporated. But Punk here had one. And then J.J. Thompson in 1897 uh, found a charge mass relationship with the electron, with his experimentation with the cathode tube. So I'm going to quickly go over the the full experimentation that he did real quick because it kind of relates to some other stuff that I'm interested in. So I'm just going to kind of give the broad perspective overview on that and then we'll then we'll tie back into the full E equals M seed squared and Einstein and all that stuff. So here's J.J. Thompson and his electron charge mass ratio discovery. Okay, so what he was doing with the cathode tube is he had two copper wires hooked up to an anode and the cathode in the tube and the anode had a little, had a slit in the center of it, so there was a focus of the of the of a uh, of the current flow within the tube, right? And that that current flow was exciting a filament in the tube, so it creates a green a green beam, right? And then a little uh, closer towards like the middle of the tube or whatever, towards the endish kind of, he had a magnet and a uh, and a uh, what is it? Two plates to set up an electric current. So what he found was is is that the uh, that the beam would kind of deflect proportional to the strength of the magnetic field and the uh or the electric current and it would go um it would follow the left hand rule so it would uh it would it would be attracted to the to the uh, positive side of the of the magnet right so uh the what they what mainstream science in physics and electricity or whatever says about the um, says about how the electron works and all this the relationship that they say is that the uh the electron is generated from the the anode and the cathode plates and the charge disparity between them is causing a uh, one second. Oh, one second, my live stream audio is not coming through. Testing, testing. Can you hear me on Discord? Yeah, I wasn't even checking your YouTube though. Hold on. <laughs> oh, shoot. Thanks, Toby. One second, guys. Sorry about that. I'm not sure. Yeah, you've been muted the whole time. Yeah, no worries. I'll just get it off of Geo's later and cancel it out. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, I canceled my screen share. There we go. Still up, right? On on Earth Awakening. We're still good on here, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. I'll get it off of that later. No, no worries. Okay, so where were we at? Uh the mainstream thing on the charge disparity creating the uh the uh the beam or whatever, right? So they say that, that that basically like little charged particles are being ripped off of the uh, of the photographic or uh, off of the anode and cathode plates, and that those charged particles are going into you know a magnetic field, and they're basing this relationship off of um, the deflection of the intensity of the uh, of the beam, right? Or uh, uh, the deflection of the intensity, the deflection of the beam based on the intensity of the magnetic field or the electric field. So they. Uh, the way that JJ describes it is that the behavior is it's acting as if the as if the mass is being changed, right? But it's not an actual physical an actual physical thing. And actually, the way that JJ originally interpreted it 
was that uh, the electron was a little was a little vortex, right? So we're going to get into we're going to get into that. Or before I get into that, I'll show the the, the diagram here. Sorry, I kind of got off track. So here's the diagram for the setup. Um, here's the cathode tube. It's just a glass vacuum tube, and then the anode and cathode here in the tube, and then the copper wires are are on the outside. They hook up uh, through the tube here, and then that uh, there's a little slit here in the anode for the uh, for the charge to go through, right? And so this is this is what the experiment overall was looking like, and uh, and that's how that's how he was doing it. And based off of that, he was coming up with uh, that charge mass relationship ratio, right? So Originally, the way that uh, JJ thought it, that it worked was that the charge potential itself was a little tiny vortex, and the mathematics and stuff to describe a, a vortex on that nature or on that level didn't exist yet. He uh, he actually invented it later, but um, before it existed, they were that, that's how they theorized it, right? So the positive and negative aren't about a charge particle and a negative charge particle per se. It's more about a direction of uh, current flow. So the atomic model, we get this thing where it's like we see this physical mass here with the little negative sign, and we think of that as like a charged particle that's, uh, or yeah, one second. We think of that as a particle that has charge to it, you know, and then like it's a negative charge. Like what the heck does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a direction of current flow, and this model is just representing that. So if you take that uh, positive and negative of the current flow, it would just make a vortex. So. And that's uh that's how they used to think about it. So when they talk about the 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 corpuscle or whatever back in the day, it wasn't necessarily that it was a particle, it was a like an ether vortex. It was a charge within the ether. So and that's uh that's what I think it is. So when you get into dielectrics and stuff, this is my interpretation of what happened with this experiment. So the uh this glass tube is a dielectric material, meaning it stores energy. So the the energy or I mean sorry, the area within it is storing energy. So this electron flow that's happening through here, and it's not due to an, uh, a charge particle uh, disparity of free electrons. It's just a current flow of charge potential. And as it's being mediated through here, through this little hole, it like, you know, follows a specific path because it's, you know, all built up and it's going through through there. So that creates your, that creates the semi-coherent beam that they get, get that they get. And then the deflection is, uh, is just, you're introducing a new medium within that, uh, within that charge potential. So it's just, it's just changing the flow of pressure mediation. That's all, that's all it is. It's just changing the flow of vortex vortexes. It's not a, a little particle that's moving around. It's just changing the flow of pressure mediation within the tube. That's my interpretation of it uh, in terms of the ether. So moving on from that, or yeah, does anyone have any questions about that before we move on to the rest of the E equals MC squared stuff? Or should I do questions at the end? Um, I don't, I don't real quick. I don't know if you were trying to be live on YouTube, but your audio went out and then it looks like the stream's not going anymore. Yeah. I just went ahead and cut it off. I didn't want to mess with it live because we're already rolling. So I'll just okay, get it cool, off cool, the cool. geos, but thank you though. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, cool. So we'll just save questions till the end then, and I'll just roll through and then we'll just, we'll do Q and A at the end. Nice. Okay. So this is from a paper from Ive Stowell, 1952. The derivation of mass and energy relation. Uh, so this is this is Ives going over and critiquing um, Einstein's derivation of E equals mc squared in his 1905 paper, and he comes to the conclusion that mathematically he couldn't have possibly have derived that conclusion without, um, uh, you know, through as a consequence of relativity theory without circular logic, right? So this whole um, so this whole charge mass ratio thing with kind of kind of came to a head when Einstein put forward the 1905 paper where he merges mass and and and, uh, and energy as as an equivalence, right? So this really changes things because in the Newtonian framework, there's um there's what's called rest mass, right? So your rest mass in the in the lab frame, so this is a rest frame, has to be uh, compatible with all your dynamic predictions. So when you go to model things out, you include actual forces. You have to, and you include conservation laws. You have to be able to uh, to account for that energy conservation and momentum conservation. And if you're gonna, and the way that they do that in Newtonian dynamics is through the uh, is, th is th uh, the the mass and momentum, right? So if you're gonna say that that's also equivalent to energy, well, then how are you gonna? You can't satisfy that, right? So that gets into a more complex nature, which we'll kind of get into at the end of how Einstein solved that. But we're gonna go through the history of 
why people would like why why people were hesitant to accept the theory and and um and the actual relationship to you know the charge ma- uh charge and mass and and that sort of stuff right so this is uh this is his uh this is this is ives's uh conclusion here so einstein and the work re- referred to in, in 1905 did not give this derivation he did not use the momentum of the radiation which is essential which is an essential element of this example and his derivation was actually incomplete to give the result he announced and this is brought to you in the appendix of the paper so he goes over the more analytical math math side of it and shows the invalidity of it but to just speaking about it uh, you know throughout the paper what einstein was doing was just avoiding uh avoiding uh, a way to co- a way to d- describe the kinetic energy of the of the radiation because he wasn't able to conserve it so he was trying to do it he came up with different angles to uh to to solve that but that's but that's after the fact um you know years later because uh throughout his whole throughout his career right uh this this uh this issue haunted him he tried to properly derive it six six separate times throughout throughout 40 years so we'll get into the history of all that in here as well too so this is uh a quote from this is like a unit analysis of the equation e equals mc squared so it's like does this side of the equation represent the units being described in this side of the equation so energy and mass so this is an analysis done by um j thompson in the book the secrets of ether so e does not equal m e or energy is a unit Mass is a dimension. Energy is composed of a dimension of mass times length squared times frequency squared. So this is the derivation of how he thinks it should be uh, properly defined, since it's not uh, since energy is a unit and mass is a dimension, right? So they're obviously uh, not the same. So mass is not conv- uh, you know in a unit analysis, right? Mass is not converted to energy, and energy is not converted to mass. Mass is merely a dimension from which the units are constructed. This uh, this is repetitive, but the understanding is merely a dimension is perhaps the greatest intellectual physical challenge for most people coming out of the 20th century. All right, so this is. So it's like, that's a bold claim, uh, Thompson D. Why do you say that? So he further says, we often hear, we often refer to nuclear reactions on the sun and nuclear power plants and nuclear bombs as example to mass energy conversion. And nuclear power plants in the United States, uh, the, where they have been operating for 60 years at a high degree of precision uh, as applied to the measurement for the amount of materials that pass through the reactor. And yet not one report available anywhere that this writer was able to obtain presents data from a nuclear power plant that shows that the mass of the fuel was exactly converted from the energy according to E equals MC squared. One would think that to prove special relativity that the data from a precisely monitored nuclear plant would provide an abundance of evidence. Nevertheless, no, no such data apparently exist and then here so he says in fact there is evidence to suggest that more energy comes out of a nuclear power plant than the mass of the fuel that goes in a liquid metal fast breeder reactor once operated for 25 years and produced and produced more fuel in its byproducts than it consumed during its operation citation 81 so we look into the citation here so the ebr2 is defined as a liquid cool metal fast breeder blah 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 it is cooled with a molten cool sodium metal. Its chain reactions are perpetuated with ex- with an extremely energetic fast uh, neutrons, and it was uh, designed with a potential for breeding more more fuel than it um, observe or than it consumes. So I went to try and track down the exact citation for this one for the 16 year operation manual. I couldn't find this exact one, but um, I did find like a cool diagram and stuff of the facility and whatnot. So just like further to the point, like if the exact ratio mattered or whatever, you would think that they would be able to kind of extrapolate that in a physically meaningful way rather than the mythology of nuclear bombs. So here's the facility, the reactor core is over here. You got a bunch of uh, water pumps over here and then you got turbines here. So it's just cycling water to the hot uh, thing here and then it cycles that to to the turbines, which creates electricity. Very cool. So here's the reactor and there's the current flow of the water that's running through it. All right, so the Ohanian review, did Einstein prove E equals MC squared? So this is a nice broad overview of the entire narrative of the E equals MC squared and Einstein's derivations of it because, um, you know, obviously not being able to logically or mathematically deduce the, it from the, from the 1905 paper is kind of like a stain in the, in the wall, right, or whatever. 
So Einstein made a bunch of attempts to uh, f- to fix it throughout uh, throughout 40 years, and we're going to go over those attempts now. So although Einstein's name is closely linked and celebrated with the relation of E equals mc squared between mass and energy, a critical examination of more than half a dozen proofs in this relation is that Einstein produced over the span of 40 years reveals that all of these proofs suffer from this mistake. Einstein's in- Einstein introduced unjustified assumptions, committed fatal errors in logic, or adopted low-speed restrictive approximations. So what I was saying earlier about the kinetic energy of the system and how he couldn't, uh, couldn't find a way- ways to do it. So instead of using, uh, so you know how when you're dealing with things at the speed of light, these are relativistic effects and you have to use your Lorentz transformations and all that stuff. So your boy was using slow speed approximations. He wasn't even using the speed of light. He was using what they're saying by that is they were using the, uh, the, uh, the inertial mass, the rest mass, the, 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 the thing that has to be compatible with all other frames in existence, right? The frame that we, that the word told now is uh is optional chosen out of convenience for the math et cetera et cetera but it's the one thing that clearly has to be um catered to otherwise none of this has any physical meaning right otherwise these the otherwise these math equations are just kinematic descriptions and they don't have dynamic covariance with the lab frame so that's what this whole thing is about especially with uh when it comes when we get into the e equals mc squared as we're getting into now with these uh with these math proofs and stuff where Einstein couldn't couldn't do it, and other people had to do it for him, and then obviously we'll get into the pseudo tensor um, pseudo tensor stuff. So, so uh, let's see. So your slow order approximations, you never succeeded in producing a valid general proof applicable to a relativistic system with arbitrary large internal speeds. The first of general, the first such proof was produced by Max Lau in 1911 for a closed system with a time independent energy and momentum tensor which is generalized by Felix Klein in 1908 for, yeah. So we'll get into that energy momentum tensor that, um, that had to, you know, it's like, cool. Like he did, you know, he did this, but like, is it, was it a fool's errand? Is it, is it, is it going to be physically meaningful in the end? Well, we'll find out towards the end here. So further on that Einstein's 1905 derivation of the celebrated relationship between mass and energy is rid- widely regarded as one of the, his seminal contributions to modern physics, but he cannot be awarded a priority to proposing such a relation. Some years earlier, J.J. Thompson, Abraham, Poincaré, and Lorenz had recognized the electrostatic energy and the charge distrib- distribution is endowed with mass and has, the, and has proposed that all, uh, all or most of the mass in the electron arises from the electrostatic self, self-energy. So all these guys um, had, had come up with different coefficients to explain a, a similar phenomenon. So the, the idea that Einstein did it first or this has to do as like a relativistic effect is, you know, not the case because if you can't even derive it in the framework, like, you know how, you remember, you remember back when we were kids in math class and the teacher was like, show your work and you were like, fuck, fuck. Now we have to like write down on the paper and show how we did the thing. Well, Einstein not only did he not make any citations in his 1905 uh, paper, which is like, you know, remember when we did book reports and we had to cite stuff like none of that shit. So they, they redefined all of physics on this with no citations and, uh, and, and, and no uh, logical mathematic derivation as a consequence of relativity um, thus far. Right. So, it, and we're like, uh, we're years into the theory at this point uh, mainstream that they had already accepted or like started to accept. So when they talk about the narrative of like, why was this? Why was there this counter anti uh, Einstein movement? Do, do, do they just hate Einstein because of his beliefs or whatever, or his heritage? It's like, no man, what he proposed was insane, and he couldn't validate it at all. And it took a long time to bury that and change the narrative and uh, and and redirect physics and not teach people about dynamic covariance with the lab frame and the importance of that, so that all these kinematic equations people just believe in as if they have physical meaning. Are actually are just gobbledygook. So, and Hassel Hasselthorne had shown that the electromagnetic radiation enclosed in the in a cavity contributes to the inertial or yeah to the inertia uh, inertia of the cavity. So, and that was the guy with the uh, oops. What did I do? All right. So that was the guy earlier with the with the closed sphere that heated it up and found that the pressure from that contributed to the apparent weight while it was heated. So did Einstein prove E equals mc squared? So who proved it? Einstein returned to 
Uh, Einstein returned to the mass energy problem in six other papers, one in 1906, two in 1907, an unpublished paper in 1912 that was published much later, and two more papers in 1935 and 1946. So, you know, swing and a miss or whatever, right? As they say, these reprises are themselves indication that Einstein had some suspicion that his proofs were unsatisfactory. Didn't Feynman say that one good proof is sufficient? Feynman says a lot of cool stuff unless it goes against the current narrative. And, w and in that case, when Feynman said it, it doesn't apply and you're just quote mining. All right. So this guy is probably just quote mining. The general proof of E equals MC squared remained elusive until 1911 when Lau finally derived the mass uh, energy relation for an arbitrary closed static system, and that is with the time independent static momentum uh, tensor containing an electric and mechanical uh, elastic chemical thermal energies of the stress, what's uh, blah, what's the end whatsoever. So his proof exploited Minkowski's tensor formalism. It was a concise and elegant. It was concise and elegant, and it avoided the t the tedious dynamical details that had frustrated Einstein. So the it, the the Lau integrated the T. This is the old. This is the old way that they used to derive the stress tensor. So this is what it used to look like in its old form. So out, uh, Lau integrated the stress tensor component for the energy momentum tensor over the volume of the system and obtained the energy momentum. And he also showed that for the closed static system, the conservation laws uh, of the stress tensor is the energy is conserved. Implies that the volume of the integral of the stress is a, or zero in the rest frame. Blah blah blah. Right. So he came. So, dude, he saved the day, right? He he came up with this way to mathematically uh, satisfy a dynamic covariance uh, through the with a relativistic transformation, right? So, from the Lorentz transformation, properties of the components of the energy tensor, he was then able to prove that the volume of the integrals of the stress tensor components of of the uh, energy momentum tensor transform as a four vector, and that the total energy of that mentor, ment uh, momentum of the energy system as a four vector. So basically they're saying that he was able to transform the momentum of it and conserve it with their stress tensor. Very cool. So in the last two papers, E equals MC squared in 1935 and 1946, Einstein reverted to his mistakes in the earliest papers. So this again gets into how he was changing the way that he was trying to account for the kinetic energy of the system so that he could, uh, make it appear as if he gave a logical mathematic derivation to uh, to this to putting forward the idea that energy is equivalent to mass times the speed of light squared. So in a 1935 paper which published which was published by Yosef or Josiah uh, Willard Gibbs lectured in the F Philadelphia thing I'm not going to read all this let's see I'm not going to make you guys sit through all that but it's just going over the, let's see, all the views with mistakes. So yeah, he just, he, every time he would do it, he would just keep doing the same thing, right? Because he really couldn't do it in the way, in the way that he was trying to do it meaningfully, right? Because it's like, well, why didn't he just use a stress tensor? Because he knew about the issue with the stress tensor that we're going to get into towards the end. So he was trying to come up with a way to do it without that and actually do it in a physically meaningful way where they could establish actual dynamics. Because until now, all these equations, all these, uh, uh, all they're doing basically is just kinematics. It's just measurements. It's just it's just ways to um, to conform a coordinate system, uh, you know, based on based on constants. And when you have that, you can con and the periodicity of an event. Well, you have the freedom to just you know express anything, and then what suddenly relativity is correct. For example, the perihelion precession. When you get into the complete solution for it, which is done with the Schwarzschild metric. Well, that metric doesn't account for the rotation of the sun, the charge potential, or anything real, or any of the energy, any quantifiable uh, dynamic variable that you would have to account for if you were actually trying to make a prediction about the sun that was that was meaningful. If they just approximated to uh, the, the sun's mass and then convert that into a gravitational field, which uh, dimensionally may or may not conserve energy based on what pseudo tensor you're using. So it, it's not... It doesn't really mean anything in the way that people think it does because it's like, oh, dude, it predicted it. Well, how's that? If you have the data for the event and you're inputting that and you're contracting that time to, to like, it's not a prediction, right? That's that's what you that's the epitome of a postdiction, right? So that's why people that's why Einstein's theories needed more supplemental proofs than just um than just the uh, than just those observations, right? So just just the uh, just the perihelion wasn't enough. Just the so-called displacement of starlight from the uh, gravitational field of the sun, which we're not even going to get into 
for this, but just those two weren't weren't enough, right? They they needed a mechanism to change the speed of light, or light, I'm sorry, they needed a mechanism to change the frequency of lights because Einstein uses he goes he goes all right, boys, there's no medium in space. Forget about all that shit. And then everyone's like, okay, I'm listening. And then he's like, here's a Doppler equation, and we're gonna contract the uh, <laughs> the energy of the light, and st- it's like and we're not gonna talk about the medium. And it's like what? So, you know, there was a lot of hurdles to overcome for all of this. And this is, this is like extremely pivotal, this mass energy conver- conversion thing, because the mathematics side of it for the people that, you know, get the mathematics, and I'm not one of those people, right? I'm not over here contracting tensors and stuff. I'm just reading what these people were talking about, what these issues are that, that were never overcome, what modern people um, that analyze, you know, the situation are finding out. So these, cri- so these criticisms are still valid, still true. And still, uh, and still ongoing, but it's just not talked about. It's like, it's like, hey man, don't tell people that can't do the math that like this shit doesn't work, <laughs> and like we can all just keep going, and every and that just seems to kind of be the general agreement. So, so we'll so we're gonna tie up here on the uh, on these uh, on these correctional mistakes here that Einstein makes over the course of uh, forty years. So nineteen oh six. So he analyzes the the motion of the center of mass of the system containing several small bodies of electric fields. He introduces the electric field energy in his definition of the center of mass, but treats the contribution of the mov- moving body as non-relativistic and only considers the rest mass. So again, so he's trying to prove these relativistic effects, but not even using the proper uh, frame because he couldn't show the dynamic relationship uh, with with, new- with Newtonian physics, right? So Einstein uh, failed to failed to con- yeah. So I just went over it. All right, so uh, strike two, right? Uh, 1907, section A. Einstein an- Einstein analyzes the extended system consisting of the electric field and the charges, and he held in a static equilibrium held by a, held by a rigid mathematical framework. So he imposed some, some further conditions in there to try and, uh, you know, create what would, what would appear to be a relativistic derivation of, uh, of mass equaling energy, and uh, that didn't work either. Tried again in 1907, section B. So he modified the 1905 work by changing the energy of the system and the action of the of the external electric field. So similar to the 19 to the other paper, he assumes that the kinetic energy has a simple particle like form. So uh, in that, he's just assuming that it's uh, he's just using its rest rest energy again. So just just literally walked in like you ever see someone go through a revolving door. And you're like, oh, that dude's gonna leave the building for sure, and then they like, and then they just don't. They just keep looping. You're like, oh, that's weird. So that's what that's what happened with that. Uh, and then so we tried again in 1912. So we're looping through the door again. Maybe he's gonna get out. So the unpublished manuscript, written in 1912, but was not published until much later, attempts to explain uh, explain it as a relativistic effect. The critique here is that it includes the same mistake as the 1905 papers, assuming that the kinetic energy is just a simple particles with the inertial rest mass without using the relativistic anything speeds or anything of the of the mass right because he couldn't conserve because he couldn't conserve it without um without using that that tensor that he told everyone was like a good tensor and it was all cool but like for some reason he's not using it for 40 years he's yo ein yo ein you have a tensor bro you use the tensor he's not doing it that's weird why in his 1935 paper einstein once assumed that the energy yeah he just does it uh let's see Minimum of the particle has a dependence of the velocity. I can't even remember what this one was. So, again, shits the bed, 1946. In, in his paper, again, Einstein repeats the same mistake. Another low-order approximation. So those are all summaries from the, from the Ohanian paper uh, going over the historicity of, uh, of Einstein's attempts to satisfy the equals mc squared as a proper relativistic effect. So astonish and this astonishing mistake, yes, this is great too. So so after all that, right, all those years of not getting it right and knowing about the tensor situation and trying to do it on his own, you know, I which I respect, you know, trying to be his own man. So th- this is an astonishing mistake, all the more so because Einstein was aware of it, but refused to recognize it for what it was. In a footnote in the 1912 manuscript, he highlighted this mistake. To be sure, this is not rigorous because additive constants might be present that do not have the, char- the character of the vector, but it seems so artificial that we will not dwell on this possibility at all. Despite this admission, he persisted that 
the mistake in all his revisions and publications of this argument over the span of more than 40 years, he first, he first wrote down his argument in the 1912 manuscript included in it several pages on the general theory in his 1921 book, the meaning of relativity in his revised book in four subsequent editions, the last of which in the night in uh, 1955, he never corrected the mistake. So uh, after all those times and all that, he was like, ah, fuck it. Like, you know, whatever we'll, 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 we'll just roll with it. So here's a letter from Big Ein in 1948 to uh, Lincoln Barnett. Einstein denounced the use of relativistic mass as it, as it was being used for special relativity. So in an attempt to, you know, get rid of this conservation issue and bring things back to uh, dynamic covariance, which is the important covariance, uh, Lorentz covariance is cool and all, but it's not as, as cool as being dynamic with the lab frame. So... In the, in the letter to Lincoln Barnett, 19 June 1948, Einstein wrote in German. The letter was typed in English, typed and sent in English. The, highlight, the, the highlighted passage in this ex excerpt says, "It is not good to introduce the concept of mass m equals uh, m divided by one minus v squared over c squared times one half of a moving body for which there is no for which no clear definition can be given." It is better introduced that no other mass concept other than rest mass, m, uh, should be used. Instead of introducing m, it is better to mention this expression for the momentum of an energy of a of a body in motion. Oh no way! So if you don't eat, so if you don't equate energy and momentum as the same thing, you can just go back to using the old way uh, to be lab frame dynamic covariant. So, 1948, Big Ein was denouncing relativistic mass because the way that he the way that he was trying to use it didn't didn't satisfy conservation laws it actually broke any physical meaningfulness to the theory and the fact that people were using the pseudo ten, the pseudo tensor like you know always bothered him right because he kept trying but couldn't get it and then if he could and then he was like trying to but the, at this point people were like fully invested in it and he couldn't even stop the train right because he's like boys let's just go back to the to the lab frame let's just go back and they were like Sorry, I we can't hear you, dog. We're, we're we're time dilating and contracting, like you know they they couldn't they couldn't get him. He was uh, stuck in a black hole. So there can be only one. I forget what that slide was in reference to, but um, you know it, maybe it'll come back to me. So um, so why Big Ein was uh, was opting out of relativistic mass. So I kind of just went over the narrative there as to why he was denouncing it. So relativity requires a different value for inertial mass of a moving object. In, uh, in its direction of motion perpend and perpendicular to that direction of motion. This contradicts the principle of relativity that the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. So E equals MC squared produces non-invariant transformations for internal, uh, I'm sorry, for inertial mass and energy, which renders it untenable to satisfy the conservation laws on the relativistic scale without supplemental stress tensors. And now we're going to get into the supplemental stress tensors, I think. So on the surface, e equals mc squared appears to give the satis uh, satisfy the conservation laws by re uh, let's see let me, let me read this properly. On the surface, e equals mc squared appears to give the appearance of the conservation of energy is is satisfied by redefining energy as a function of mass to supplement the logical inconsistency of the theory itself. After forty years, Einstein did not. Uh, after forty years, what what did Einstein bring to the table for deriving e equals mc squared as a relativistic effect? In all of his proofs, the main contention is that while the total energy comprising of both the kinetic and potential energy remains constant, the potential energy can be interpreted as contributing to, to, uh, to an augmented resting mass. The interpretation implicitly alters the definition of mass to align with the desired conclusion. So that was the circular reasoning that I still well was pointing out, that it's like you can't even get here mathematically unless you already assume what you're doing is, the, is, a, is, is facts, right? So induction and atomism. So this is more in regards to um, to the electron situation earlier. So I should probably have moved that slide up. So we're getting close to the end now. So uh, let me we'll come back to that. So let me write out the momentum on the tensor thing before I fully lose everyone. So uh, Einstein made the assumptions about kinetic energy of the of the extended systems without or yeah, systems having the same form of a particle without having the solid justification for the proof of this assumption. So without being able to provide relativistic mass derivations, he had to keep using rest mass. 
So there was no reason for him to say that e equals mc squared. So Lau and Calvin used conservation laws with the stress tensor TUV to satisfy them. E equals mc squared was mathematically proven with a little asterisk disclaimer. And this little asterisk disclaimer is what Einstein didn't want to happen to his, uh, you know, to be, to be tarnished, you know, associated with him, right? He didn't want an asterisk next to his uh, derivations and stuff, right? So Einstein never proved that th this, this assertion about E equals mc squared without circular reasoning and trying to derive the solution from what he had already assumed to be true. So if we remember back to the mathematical framework of uh, a special relativity being Lorentz covariant adhering to Lorentz symmetry, right? It's not even Einstein's framework. So when he just co-opted the entire framework, like this stress tensor situation was like his only way out, right? Because other people had already um, had already had already uh, realized a charge mass ratio relationship, but they weren't trying, but they weren't foolish enough to say that that was actually uh, you know changing the changing the mass on that level that Einstein was trying to equate it to. So, uh, you know, they were, they weren't down for all that. So we're going to get into what a first order intrinsic, uh, differential invariant is. Uh, and this is what this pseudo tensor here is. This is what this is. And we'll get into what that means here in a second. All right. So the conclusion here from this paper, I wanted to read off real quick because it gives a nice uh, outro to what we're about to discuss. So this is from uh, Tomb F, Myths Surrounding the Time Dilation in E equals MC squared. The Lorentz transformation equation, as used in Einstein's theory of relativity, are simply the equations of a Doppler effect as applied to a ray, but interpreted as, as the absence of the medium for the propagation of light along with the absurd conditions that light is a constant without any means of reference. This leads to the further absurd concept of time dilation, a, uh, never mind the paradox known as the, as the clock paradox, whereby two clocks can tip both tick slower than one another. We, we all know, however, that the, passage of time, uh, that the passage of time doesn't change its rate according to perspective. When, uh, when the Earth completes its orbit around the sun relative to the background stars, one year has passed for everyone. So the Lorentz transformation does not, or does not actually apply to time, as uh, in space, as it would incorrectly be applied to the physical medium for propagation of light. With the time and space variables pertaining to the angular period of the circumference of the tiny ethereal vortices within, or which, according to Maxwell, comprise of the luminiferous medium, the speed of light is determined from the uh, circumference. Circumferential speed of the <laughs> of the <laughs> of these constitute, constituted vortices. So the the speed of the vortices uh, determines the speed of light. So what they were saying here with the uh, with the time situation, right? So with 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 saying the space is you know th there is no medium out there in this in this and he just applies it to the radiation, right? So what he so the reason that they had to say time is changing, right? They had to explain the change in the frequency of light without a mechanism. To explain why they're using the Doppler effect to change the like you know the compression or expansion of a wave to to explain that uh, energy exchange without a medium, they, the time dilation is just a story, which leads to the clock paradox, which obviously has never been manifested, and I and and GPS clocks aren't synced to Einstein's uh, Einstein's clock synchronization, right? So this is completely unmanifested. This is just some shit that they talk about for fun. This is all just like oh, dude, if you if you're at a higher gravitational potential and you're your twin and you'll you'll be old you you'll be older than your twin like no 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 not in any physically meaningful way mathematically you know sure but like you'll only see that kind of pronounced effect in movies like um what was that one with Matthew McConaughey that that had the black hole in it you know what I'm talking about interstellar yeah yeah you'll only see like oh dude we're next to the black hole and then they get out, they go back to the ship and like your boy aged like five years or whatever it was, you know, it's like, you'll only, you'll only see that kind of craziness in, in, in film. Like it's not, it's not real. It's just mathematical derivations to satisfy conditions that uh, obviously aren't real. Like the space isn't a vacuum. Uh, so let's see here. So let's see. Meanwhile, the equation e equals MC squared does not have the general applicability of mass and energy equivalents as claimed by as claimed by Einstein this equation first appeared in its embryonic equation uh in its embryonic form sorry if 
by Maxwell in his 1861 paper on physical force lines in connection with the density and elasticity of the luminiferous ether. In simple, it, it is simply Newtoni, Newton's equation for the speed of the speed of a wave in an elastic solid. The, real, the realization was noted in more recent times by Dr. Minami in connection with the binding energy, and is explained in the twentieth. Uh, and is explained in his work, the twentieth. I'm sorry, the mass energy equivalence deception, the greatest deception in the twentieth century physics, and, and elaborated in section four of the double helix theory of the electric uh, magnetic, or I'm sorry, of the magnetic field, and then in an article about pressure radiation and E equaling mc squared. The e equals mc squared uh, has never arri never arises unless electromagnetic radiation is involved, whether it be black body radiation, X-ray, gamma, etc. These equations apply neither to the radiation itself or the or the or to the wave propagation medium, as it is the very same luminiferous medium that Einstein discarded and the greatest acts of scientific vandalism ever performed. Wow. So if you so yeah so if you want to get real real familiarized with some dense material. Uh, if you if you want to see like what what these uh what it means to like contract a tensor and and apply conditions to it and do a transformation with it and all that and then like show that it's an uh a non or that it's not an invariant transformation and that it breaks covariance uh check out this video here i'll have it linked in the description oops not going to play it out but it's a 18 minute video he goes over the math breaks it out goes over the history of it uh contraction it sh shows the issue with it so this issue about um, the stress tensor, how it's um, how it's a first order uh, intrinsic differential invariant. That issue was pointed out, you know, long ago in the past, and it's just kind of not something that's not really talked about. Some new tensors are put forward that's that are said to satisfy the conditions properly, but they're actually also the, the, they also suffer the same fate as the uh, original stress tensor. Um, because your boy uh, Stephen Crothers here did did a same did a similar analysis on those and found that they're all just the same thing because they're all derived from the same thing and it's not um you, you you can't do that once you violate the structure of it of the mathematical framework it's not it's no longer valid as a physically meaningful uh as it as, as to say something like oh yeah the space-time curvature is why that's doing that like now nah, that goes out the window when you break uh covariance within the mythology of of uh of einstein right because the covariance is like the one rule that they have to apply to or that, that they have to adhere to. So I got some slides here to give some supplemental definitions. If you guys want to go and watch the Crothers work later, he doesn't really lay out um, what the words and stuff mean. So kind of did some definitional work here. So you guys can go over uh, covariance, invariant, transformations, the tensors, the pseudo tensor. So an object that's uh, like a tensor, a tensor, but it's only invariant under certain coordinate system transformations. So it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't mean anything. So the first order intrinsic differential, uh, sorry, the first order intrinsic differential invariant, I have it typed backwards here, it's differential invariant. So it's a type of invariant tensor that is coordinate dependent and changes under transformation. It is composed solely of the components of the tensor and its first derivatives, and it is not derived from the field equations themselves, and it cannot be obtained from the second order field equations, which violates the mathematical structure of the theory based on the principles of covariance and the idea that the physical laws should be independent of the choice of the coordinate system. So if you guys remember back to Einstein's first postulate, uh, all, re all inertial reference frames are equally valid. So that's, that's called Lorentz symmetry or uh, uh, what is it, Lorentz covariance. So any transformation within uh, using Lorentz equations, I'm sorry, uh, the, the gamma corrections, all of those should be uh, invariant transformations. So the speed of light, the laws of physics, all of that should be invariant under transformation. So anything that's a law of physics, um, so like, so F equals MA, that sort of stuff, is it going to be the same in this reference frame or that reference frame? So all of that stuff is is validated, one, through the mathematics, and then from there, it's, it's, a, it's a hypothesis waiting to be experimentally verified. But for mathematics' sake, j uh, before you can even um, pretend that it has any meaning, the covariance has to be established, right? So that's what that's what all that's getting to on the analytical side of it. So it's a really interesting subject to get into um, on that side of it because it really exposes the nature of of what's going on here. Because it's like how how do how do these equations make these crazy predictions, right? It's like, well, <laughs> uh, are these predictions dynamically covariant with anything? Like, do they mean anything? 
what variables are they accounting for? When you whip out a Swartz child metric in your in your perihelion processing, what what actually are you accounting for? Right? And it's like, oh, so this isn't this isn't dynamics. This isn't physically meaningful. This is this is a role play. So I think that's the end of the slides there. Yep. I think that's it. So we are now open to the public. This is this is this is the role play. It's just a live action role play, guys. Everyone go home. It's all set. <laughs> Dude, that was awesome. Thank you, sir. Then I have I don't think I have a question, but like a contribution, I guess, in the form of corroborative observation and akin speculation, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So like when you think about what Robert Bennett was talking about on which it show, you know, when his onslaught on relativity with the experiments that he brought up that tried to prove relativity, but always failed and mysteriously worked when you accounted for a stationary earth and a rotating ether. And when all the measurements would always come back to oh well in the lab frame, we can measure it and then we can translate it to other reference frame coordinate systems, but it always comes back to like beta prime or the original reference frame. The only one that matters, right? The stationary earth frame. And that served as like, uh, insurmountable barrier for furthering heliocentric lore mathematically and scientifically for a while until Einstein comes along, right? And when you think about it, the ramifications of that E equals MC squared, like it's astounding. If, if like energy equals mass and mass equals energy, then like if, if lab frame has always been fixed and at the center, and no measurement can be made outside of this until like, Einstein made it so all frames are equal, this is like devastating to like rationality and the pr progression of where we were going and essential to their you know obfuscation and then like deviation down nonsense road by saying mass is energy energy is mass he invented like coordinate system transforms that would like obscure truth later and be used to do the coordinate systems and the uh you know obfuscation of true coordinates and the satellites and the shit that you've been working on <clears throat> And then they had to adopt like Lorentz contractions to explain the excess when converting between back and forth and the coordinate system between like ECEF and ECI, as, as Bennett was going over quite coherently. Because in reality, you can only make measurements in the lab frame, which can never move. So like even when you mathematically describe how you can translate the measurements in the lab frame to different lab frames using E equals FC squared, it's kind of like a backhand way. He simultaneously invented like not only, you know, the send science down the system of relativism, but a system of relativism that leaked from math like into science and then philosophy and then religion and then eventually morality. Like the most devastating hit is like that literally led to moral relativism peering into every aspect of human reality and was probably the biggest like strive forward towards the mathematical construction of a world of heliocentricity that there ever was. Right. Like they didn't even need any of that shit. Like special relativity in that that time span broke physics basically. I mean, they they just desperately held on to their model and then they don't even like Alan's just showing, they don't even use any of that shit. You know? And then and then the science that's progressing today, like quantum physics, they basically just renamed the ether physics. I mean, y'all y'all heard it, you know, the foam, the freaking uh, all the renames of it, but yeah, they they just basically slam brakes on on science, man. In my opinion, and um, and it, it found a way to progress on its own. But uh, that shit didn't apply to nothing in uh in our reality, basically. But it's stuck. Well, they found ways around it, man. But um, I appreciate all the work Alan's doing, man. And uh, kind of picking up, man. I I I, pre I appreciate you giving me credit too. I, all I did is is go back and look at some and pulled up the Ron Hatch and made a little video in Austin and ran with it. And then Alan really ran with it, dude. And he's broke it open uh, like oh, dude, open, man, dude, dude. So check it out real quick. Let's let's go over the ECI reference frame and the significance of the eth ether nice. real quick. So you remember my boy GPS? <clears throat> so. Uh, actually, let's let's tee it off with Wang real quick, and then we'll get into the actual documents. Let's see. Is this the right one? Fingers crossed. Okay, cool. So, contrary to the appearance of the range measurement, this is Wang uh, 2000, whatever. So, contrary to the appearance of the range measurement equation, the speed of the receiver V does not appear explicitly. In, uh, the speed of the receiver is implied in the definition of the position of the receiver. The composition of the, uh, I'm sorry, the position of the receiver at reception time compared to the position of the, let's see, compared to the position of the stationary receiver at reception time, the position of the moving receiver and 
the reception of and the reception time is different and the difference is proportional to the speed of the moving receiver how could it possibly be uh proportional to the speed of the moving receiver unless there's a mechanism in which all motion is relative to some sort of etheric background perhaps but we'll get into what that means exactly so it's like okay well maybe there's some correction after the fact maybe blah 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 okay no cool maybe maybe so here's the icd documents from 1994 let's see so this is how they used to word it, but then it's it's a little obvious uh, this way. So they they change it in subsequent documents. So this, and we'll get into into the change. So this is the uh, way that they used to say it. 1994, the Doppler shift of the frequency of the sig of the res uh, the received carrier signal is proportional to the relative velocity of the receiver with respect to the satellite along the line of sight from the receiver to the satellite. So what they're saying here is this Doppler shift mechanism. There's a frequency. The speed of light is changing proportional to the velocity of the receiver. Is what they're saying. So here's how they show it Plus in me. modern. Yep. Here's how they show it in modern times. Real quick. So they give you this cool diagram. They talk about GPS time, the time the signal was sent. It's encoding all your relative coordinates, all that stuff. And then blah 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 goes in through a filter and coordinate converter. And then the output is the user position, velocity, and time. And time. How in how did you get the velocity correction? Do you ask? Well, it turns out that Wang's paper is all predicated on telling us exactly how GPS works. How does GPS work, Wang? So GPS is <laughs> it's, uh, is, a, is a successful operation based off of a range measurement equation that uses an ECI reference frame. What's the ECI reference frame? You ask. This is a stationary, non-rotating reference frame. But what they really did is equate the uh, the rotation of the Earth and make it equate make it equal to the rotation of the stars so that oh. they would be rotating together. So they have this measurement. Where the, where, so they have this measurement where the speed of light is actually the, is actually C the way that they intend it to be. But then they have this leftover remainder. So what do they do? They transform to the ECEF uh, reference frame, which is where they say we live, the rotating ball and all that stuff. But that's just a map coordinate system. It doesn't mean we're on a ball. It's like, relax, guys. So they take that and they... Um, they with that transformation, they have that remainder left over. The, well, that remainder left over is the velocity correction that they have, which would uh, completely if they didn't uh, if they didn't disguise it in this way with the transformations, the the original measurement would be a complete invalidation of special relativity on the face of it because the speed of light would yep. be changing would be changing proportional to the velocity of the observer, and there's no mechanism for that in in relativity theory. Because the ether is superfluous yeah. or whatever, so it doesn't exist. So there can't be a background medium. So the same way that like someone going through uh, water and, and sonar propagating through it, right? There would they would be a delay proportional to the velocity of the person uh, through the water, right? So that's the same mechanism. What, what's 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 doing that for uh, for the electromagnetic propagation from the from the satellite in space, right? It's it's the ether, guys. So that's that's what this whole situation is about that's what the eci transformation um is is what it covers up because what we find out here through how gps works it being a time interval system based on a range measurement equation that first order measure that uh that first measurement taken is a first order measurement that's accurate down to the millimeter that should be applicable to any coordinate system under transformation based on them all being synced to the same time so there should be no reason to even uh there should be there shouldn't even be a velocity uh, correction in that it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't work that way uh so it's unnecessary it's a death nail bro right so but like so that's that's what we're talking about right so that's all these things have been known these barriers have been put up science has been done rational minds have prevailed and then einstein comes along does some mathematical nonsense bogart some mathematical equation says actually e equals mc squared and things contract and you can't dilate but actually you can't detect it or measure it or see it and now now we're going with that and so we have this like degrading system of moral relativism as a direct result of his ridiculous appropriation of, of nonsense like previous mathematical concepts that weren't him that weren't his to try to describe and appropriate things that and his dynamic system he's never accounted for because it's always just been a kinematic equivalence mathematical nonsense description. It kills me when they say, "Yeah, you, you got you have GPS because of because of uh, Einstein and shit like that." Bro, all and and even with uh, quantum mechanics nowadays, they're like, you wouldn't have cell phones or any of that shit. Like, dude, 
they, they the transistor came before the mathematics. You know, they invented the shit, and then did the mathematics kind of. You know, they used that to upgrade shit. But but all that unnecessary mathematics, man, with a. Uh, with SR is is a joke, man. It's like, dude, we'd still have all that shit. They act like the math came before any of the inventions. You know, as far as pinning it down and maybe making shit more efficient, then the math comes. But uh, if it, you know, the the, the transforms are really, I don't know, man, unnecessary. Just a bunch of unnecessary. When you hear dude. transform, if it if it doesn't have anything to do with yeah. the inertial frame of reference, it's it's bullshit. <laughs> wasn't wasn't there a quote in there of like? It's like the most insidious deception known to like science or something. The way he describes oh, scientific, was, scientific yeah. vandalism. But like so, the way that was so eloquent and beautiful. But really, like it's the most devious thing to try and say everything is equal. Like this one reference frame that's always mattered. The way we can take measurements and do things and make predictions. Uh, that's the only one in reality. That's you know the Earth centered or er, er, Earth fixed no movement. But uh, well, we can translate it to these other frames and tell you the Earth is moving, but that one is the only one that matters, except this dude came along and made it so nothing matters, everything's equal, all reference frames are just as valid, therefore nothing matters, and, you know, nihilistic, like, ploy. It, dude, it's like the most devastating thing to ever happen, I think. Dude, and then didn't even do it within the validity of the mathematical structure that he proposed, right? No, just like, that's, that's how you that, justify that's it. How you, <laughs> That's how you know how propped up this 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 stuff is because your boy came through with no citations of the theory that adheres to another guy's namesake for symmetry for transformations and it's like did you cite him no dude he says that he came up with it before he even heard of that guy's work even though we have like the private letters to his wife where he was like yo Lorenz is working on that new transform dog I got to get in there and see what's good like <laughs> like what what the hell happened man. Dude, he just like, we just let stuff. like we just we just he let just, this ride for so long, and it's he, like now all the all these bright minds go into these math equations, and they're like assuming relativity is correct, and they force the correctness out of the mathematics through um through a framework that's that's been uh, that's structurally compromised, right? That has no validity to it. Had to keep that Earth moving. They had to keep that Earth moving, man. They couldn't stop that by no means. But just flipped everything. So that means like Ridiculous. Einstein's contribution to like this to to deter us from the truth, to keep us buried in nonsense is like the most monumental one throughout history. Yeah. Dude, everything they've done to keep the earth moving, it's like, you know, they do the test, yo, the test. Yo, one right second, there, Brian. Let like, me go over something real quick. No, no, That's... No, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you're good. You're good. So um so in this in this letter here where Einstein's like Yo, man, there's no, there's no clear definition of, of like a mechanism for this equivalence. Like, sorry, like let's let's abort, right? So he used that same criticism against the guy that he ripped an equation off of to explain the perihelion precession in his first derivation. So the Paul Gerber controversy. So Einstein, let's pull this up real quick. So where was, uh, let's see, Paul Gerber. Yeah. So he stole this dude's equation right here. So this Paul Gerber guy came up with a mechanism um, for how he was explaining the propagation of gravity through light, basically. So he was tying the speed of the propagation speed of the gravitational field to the speed of light. So he was saying that light was uh, the mechanism by which it was, you know, propagating through, right? So that was his explanation for it. He has a full mathematical breakdown thing. You can um you can pull it up. It's called uh it's not cited here. It's called something something gravitation. But anyway, he has a he has a full framework for how he got here, right? Uh for this equation. And then Einstein comes in with this identical look suspiciously identical equation where the only variable change is he has a capital T and instead of saying that the uh, speed of the gravitational propagation is tied to the speed of light, he's saying that the he's saying that t is the pericity of the um, of Mercury's orbital period, right? So it's just a kinematic prediction, right? It doesn't have any actual uh, validity to it, or you know, it's not uh, dynamic or anything. But it's just like they just changed this, contracted the time of the orbital period to get the precession, and that was his mechanism for it, you know. And he's going to criticize this dude. Or, you know, he, he so this is how he hand waves dismissed uh, 
being accused of plagiarism. He says, Einstein says, uh, let's see, if this guy wants to make us believe that the perihelion shift of Mercury can be explained without the relativity theory, so that there are two possibilities. You either invent the interplanetary mass or you rely on the work of Gerber, who already gave the right formula for the perihelion shift before me. The experts are not only in agreement that Gerber's derivation uh, wrong is uh, is wrong through and through, but the formula cannot be obtained as a consequence as the main assumption made by Gerber's work and therefore is completely useless in and is an unsuccessful and er- an erroneous theoretical attempt. Oh, no way, Einstein. So if, if you can't show your work and it, it, it's not fucking, it doesn't work out the way uh, you say it does and you have to make a circular logic to force your math into it, to get to, to to make something a consequence of a relativistic effect. You're saying that that makes it invalid. So let me let me read this again real quick. It says, "This is the highlighted passage in the excerpt says it is no good to introduce the concept of relativistic mass where m equals the change of mass relative to the speed of the body. For for there is for for wait wait what of a moving body for which no clear definition can be given. It is better to introduce no other mass concept other than rest mass." Instead of introducing M, it is better to mention this expression as the momentum and energy of the body. Cool. So no clear definition. It's a completely useless and unsuccessful and erroneous theoretical attempt. Got it. Shout out to your boy, Paul Gerber, who gave it a solid attempt to uh, explain the uh, perihelion procession through uh, Newtonian dynamics. He gave it a good try, but, you know. Dude, when uh, Bennett was doing his thing, it, like he went through like I don't know, twelve or thirteen different experiments where relativity failed utterly, and a stationary yeah. Earth with a rotating <laughs> just you know it worked perfectly, and it's just it's, it's just weird. Alan yeah. drops on that, bro. That was awesome, dude. And uh, he broke it down like really, really broke it down. And uh, and from what from what I understand, you you uh you contacted and reached out to that guy, and he had a, a real open mind, man. He uh a big big massive shout out for that, bro. Yeah, dude. He was like the sources that Alan was researching for the shit that he was looking into, and then one day he just like the interview yeah. reached out. He showed up in chat. And he was like, oh shit. Is that no, are you the Robert Bennett that wrote this paper that I'm reading? What the <laughs> fuck? Dude, he subbed to me on YouTube. Nice, nice. He sub. I saw the sub pop up, and it was like Robert Bennett, and I was like, "No way, that's dude from this paper I just read." And it, <laughs> it, and was, it was. Funny feeling. And he was looking for. Um, he was interested in the ether dynamic stuff that I was reading. He was looking and he was trying to get an English translation of that Asutovsky book because your boy has got the first English translation of it. Did you translate it all by AI and then give it to him? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> In that order. That <laughs> yeah, there's this really cool AI called, uh, let me pull it up here. So it, it's really awesome. So it's you You sign up for like the, the ultimate free edition, or, or I'm sorry, the ultimate premium edition of it, but it's free, no charge, and you cancel within 30 days. They don't charge you. So you just sign up with a valid credit card and all that, and then you cancel it immediately, and you can, trans, you can um, translate up to 500 or 5 million what is it? Uh, yeah, you can transfer up to five million words or letter characters or whatever um, at a time. So basically, that that book was six hundred and twenty five pages. So I I, tr- I was able to get like over half of it, um, you know, translated with just one, Bro. just in just in one attempt. So it's like it's it's awesome. That's a word. Yeah, you- That's a word for every Wang experiment, man. Yeah. No, they- oh, for Miller, <laughs> for Miller, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a word for every Miller measurement, dude. Exactly. So yeah, we have the Faraday induction generator where the lab frame makes the p- correct prediction. Um, you know, that's cool. And then so this this ether vector thing is awesome. I kind of started dabbling in this a little bit. So with get this, Shane, you'll like this. It involves electron interferometry. Do I have your attention yet? I like that <laughs> electron in- interferometry. Very cool. So what they have here is a solenoid, which produces a magnetic field within this uh, within this wiring or within this uh, tube structure. So they they say that mathematically speaking, outside of the tube structure, the magnetic the magnetic field is basically zero. Like it's not even anything that you would ever consider. Blah blah blah. Right. So they they hit up your boy with an electron uh, wave, and they find that there is an interference pattern produced. So what they've uh, determined from that is that there is a vector potential, meaning that there's a force that exists outside of the generation of the magnetic field that's generating the magnetic field. And uh, that's what they prove there. And so they kind of 
co-opted that as like a quantum blah 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 you know situation but like wait wouldn't that like disprove the self-perpetuating field that they have since invented though how the opposite of that (laughs) how dare how dare you so so there's that with it and then when you get into the uh to the mathematics of it so if you know the vector potential you can describe the convergence i'm sorry the divergence and the uh the radial change so like the size of the toroidal and the uh, the convergence of the tor- the toroidal field, so you can you can figure that out if you have the um, if you have the vector potential. So the vector potential supersedes the uh, the other two potentials that you would have to use to figure that out, right? Because you could you could derive it doing some other like I don't know the proper terminology, right? I'm still learning sure. it, but this is like the basic rundown of it. So so mathematically, the vector potential super the 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 background medium that's giving energy to the thing supersedes uh supersedes it mathematically because if you have that you can derive the the uh the size and curl of it so Very cool. alan would that would that uh oh yeah would that apply to like like dc generators like the fields like oh, you i took one apart i'll make this real quick and it's like you have the coil and then you have other coils there's no there's no magnets in there so they they don't have to claim magnetic fields or anything but what are they claiming like the the stagnant coils are just electrons are just bouncing around the whole time. There's obviously a field present within. Is that what you're just describing? Apply to to the reality of of things like that, like these, like like home generators and gas power generators and shit. Uh, so anything that I'm generates a magnetic out. field would what does this? Like the 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 vector potential comes from anything that generates that. So anything that does it. Was that what Bennett was talking about with his like loop formula when we were going through it and then we had to stop because I had no idea what the hell he was talking about and then we've both yeah, that? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, now, yeah. You, now you've understood it. Nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is the follow up. So yeah, I watched a couple videos on the experiment to kind of see nice. what they were doing. I linked I linked some in the uh in the King's chat. So if, if you scroll up you'll see um a really funny uh thing they did. So th- there's this channel called um one second, scrolling up to get the name. He's a he's a cool channel. It's called the Silent the Science Asylum. He does some pretty cool videos, and what he says at the end here, he's like, uh, one second. Yeah. So at the so at the end of the video where he's talking about this, uh, God dang, that experiment, he goes, uh, in regards to the field that's not supposed to be there that because it exists there you know he just goes oh well it turns out there's a field there so that explains the the uh the fringe displacement thank god everything's solved and it's like no 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 it's like no 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 there's not supposed to be a field there not everything solved so like yeah it was just interesting it was interesting how they co-opted it because he's just like he was like we were about to refute the whole model but Turns out there's a field there, so we're all good. It's like no, so it's okay, no, no. It's okay. We found this energetic background that makes everything work, <laughs> but we'll just discount it completely. No, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, essentially that's the flaw in most of their conversations, right? Is they, you know, what you don't know can't hurt you. Essentially, <laughs> essentially I got one more yeah. question for you, Alan. Is it possible, that, like, like Wayne? Wayne like we reached Ooh. out to Wang a little bit, you know, and um, and and he kind of uh, is it possible that like like somebody like Wang and and a couple others like him, were were just looking at the experiments themselves and going against mainstream science because they never really followed it out to the to the uh, logical conclusion like like what it what it means for the earth and all that and they were just looking at reality and then oh, now man. like when you go to reach out and, and uh and you kind of mentioned some of the implications and all that like he is it possible that he never really thought it through and he's just going based on reality and what the experiments are showing and that now he's like oh shit you know uh, is that possible like why he ain't responding as like he should be kind of man because you're, you're uh, promoting not like miller weighing and all them is, is it possible they just just really never really thought about the logical conclusions about what it means for the earth be, being in the center and in the inertial reverence frame. I mean, you, you, have you thought of that yet? What do you think? Nah, I didn't think of it yet. Well, so that's what a lot of the esoteric teachings, um, I mean, that's almost the heartbeat of it, right? It's just the mystery of the mystery of the mystery that can go on forever. Right. Well, and, uh, dude, but, Wang. you know, there's gotta be an end, but yeah. Wang Wang wasn't part of the dude. Like he uh, 
he understands the ramifications full well, and because of the pressure that some building it to the down down that side, he decided full well to not do that. Just stopped and just like see well, yeah, so yeah, so when Alan asked some questions. Right? When Alan asked some questions retired. regarding the ECF, like he was just like, Oh, no more answering after that. And Bennett kind of sniffed him out. So what you gotta think is like Bennett's retired and can talk about it without repercussion, but Wang's in the field still publishing stuff, and if he okay, sides with it, then it, then he can't publish it anymore, and he just decided no. Okay, I'll yeah, let you know. Sir. He's still out in the field. Then. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you didn't know that, Brian. Shame, it's a damn shame, man, that they, you know, what was that, Al? I said, oh, you didn't you didn't know that he was still working? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't know Oh, that. yeah, yeah, he's still at the University of Minnesota. So yeah, yeah he so was. He, Bennett said that he um, kind of alluded to the fact that he was like, you know, not willing to pursue it because he was afraid that it would interfere with his career. Oh, which uh, program is he in? I live in Minnesota. Uh, University of Saint Cloud or whatever. <laughs> oh, Saint okay, Cloud, yeah, Minnesota. Oh, hold yeah, on, that's right here at the top up. of the paper, boys. Here we go. Oh. Saint Cloud State University, Ruyang Wang. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the popular engineering one of them. Yeah. For cheaper, realistic engineering. That but was yeah, here's, here's, here's what I speculate about Wang and his what he knows or doesn't know. I think he knows about the ether. He does a good job of breaking... He's, he's explaining here this situation with the... Uh, that there's a... Uh, uh, what's it called? That, that there's a proportional you know, situation going on with the variance and the speed of light. And then he goes on to make the comparison of sonar propagating through, you know, a wave and giving that, you know, context to it. So it's like when you think about it like that, it's like, well, what is the electromagnetic propagation going through? Seems to well, be very, to your it, point it seems like the, he kind of, seems like he kind of alluded to the ether. Yeah, and for okay. a career kind of perspective, the only people in the world right now that are reasonably doing experiments on a large enough scale, literally the size of the Earth you know, joke intended, um, to actually get that, that variation, you know, to actually get statistical significance and all that, then potentially get published, but then it's all in the military's hands. I, I think a lot of it ends up in that kind of loop, essentially. You know, whether these people consciously or subconsciously are, yeah. you know, blocking well, things out. It, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's, it's interesting you mentioned that, because Wang, one of the experiments he did in 2004, this fiber optic, cable that he used was given to him on loan from the military i think it was like five million dollars or something it was like some state-of-the-art yeah. <laughs> uh fiber optic yeah, coil that has like materials. you know a, a refractive index of 99.9999999999999 or whatever <laughs> it's like the speed of light can just you know really rip through that bad boy so this is like the most accurate well, thing ever measured you know at the time and and it just like completely falsified relativity and it showed that you know only the lab frame makes the correct prediction because he also had a uh, a conveyor here that was uh, held up by air, so like you know that that frictionless bad boy just uh, dragging along with the conveyor motion, and it doesn't you know doesn't doesn't work for uh, relativity in the way that they say it should because it's oh, you know doing linear motion. Yeah. So it's like he falsified it to an un, to a crazy degree of specificity, <laughs> and then when and then when Bennett hit him up and was like, "Yo, you're trying to follow up on that." And really, it really zipped that body back up. And, <laughs> he was like, uh, nah. Wang, Wang was like, nah, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm you, out. No, and, and, that, and that's crazy because if you read Wang's papers, he's got a whole um, collection on ResearchGate. He's proposing like these like intricate experiments to falsify relativity with GPS. He's like, look, we can settle it once and for all. Like, he sounds like he's like, he's like, he's like in the papers, dude, like he's about it, you know, but in his career life, he's like, nah, man, Einstein's legit. It's all good or whatever. Like, let me get another fiber optic cable to hang myself with. So, <laughs> oh, this reminds yeah. me, uh, there, there's, so, so, you know, how there's the idea of the great filter and stuff like that in outer space. I mean, it applies to inner space too, but, um, with the kind of unseen, the unveiled things, I've noticed a lot of times popping up like gold being diamagnetic, no coincidence mm. that it's a highly sought after, you know, highly overpriced metal, uh, just just stuff like that. And I think I was even calculating out like what the frequency would be Ow. of consciousness based on what some anesthesiologists discovered. 
And then I find out that all the calculators don't go past that, you know, kind of calculation typically for like literally oh, yeah. number of digits. And things. But I don't know. It's just, it's like, there's a bunch of like uh, limitations of measurement systems and stuff that aren't really intended, but you know, they just kind of linger on and, and you know, until we put pressure on them, like stuff like this, where there's obviously an ether because there's a fluid below every level and above every level, right? It's just, you know, whose toes you're stepping on and, uh, you know, is it actually going to do good to, to bring it out to the public and have like that? The military's got to be using some of this ether technology, though, like, like say, yeah, like compressed yeah. air technology, like with the turbines for compressed air to get more air going to the fuel. Fuck that. Like, why don't they use this the same type of technology to to uh, to have coils spinning, have the, this this fast ass air moving and like kind of like a DC powered, uh, a gas powered generator. Like you just have the coils spinning that already have a magnetic field. Uh, that propagate a field that that uh that ignite that excite the the uh, the main coils and they'd have like quadrupled the freaking the energy. I mean, yeah, it's, more, it's a real I mean, nuclear. That's probably what they're yeah. actually using in, in the drones that are that are flying around and shit, man. Oh yeah, and I think I, I've noticed a trend too where a lot of these technologies, like where you could probably cancel the inertial mass of a, an aircraft or whatever you want, right? I mean. I've literally watched people on YouTube do it. I've watched people stop light on YouTube. <laughs> I mean, they're just legit filmings and stuff. But I think when military develops the technology and it's literally written in laws, you know, if they don't have safety around it, you know, it's kind of their liability if they end up releasing stuff to the public. And, uh, you know, they were they're in a no, you know, they knew they have data that it's not safe in certain ways. And I, a lot of that points back to that as far as stuff they're actively using now, right. That we see. And it's like, this obviously doesn't jive with stuff we normal people use. Kind of like you're saying. Have have one turbine and, uh, and really spending nothing, just whatever it takes to get it up and running and, and running like two other turbines or maybe even three just off the, the electric energy produced from the damn one. I mean, and you have seen the mercury stuff where, there's the whole stigma around mercury because there's money in it, right? If you can control the market, again, silly control the market money games. But, I mean, you could even touch mercury, but sure enough, there's all these designs where you just spin it really fast and let it keep going. And the dielectric properties, along with the inertial um, you know, momentum you're creating with that, you do all sorts of things, right? If you literally just go build the diagrams you see on any weird, sketchy web, you know, website that somebody's found over Is Mercury time. Is mercury dielectric? Sometimes. It, uh, no, not dielectric, but I mean, I meant like interactions with the dial. I guess the electric field. Oh, you watched too much. No, yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah, I was just like, yeah, yeah. I was like, I I was know, like oh, no way, man. that's crazy. Because I just started learning about dielectric stuff. Anyway, what were you saying, Shane? Oh, yeah, are, are we are we done with the? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. If nobody else has any questions, uh, Gio, we could probably wrap up. Obviously, I'll stay, uh, hang around for a little bit, and uh, if anyone else has any additional stuff. But if you want to switch it back to the normal stationed programming, I'd, g- I'd g- go ahead and wrap it up or whatever. Man, that's a great presentation, man. It's always so thought provoking, man. Yeah, that's uh, been one of the topics I've been trying to kind of wrap my head around just kind of the speed of light moving and pretty much all those experiments you're talking about. I've never heard of half of them. So I don't know, it's really eye opening. You should watch uh Witsit's last uh, in the field with Robert Bennett. He brought up four, no, like 14 or 15 corroborative experiments of the same, all with the same conclusions, astoundingly coming to the same conclusion that the rest frame is the only one that matters. Yeah, it's not surprising. All the guys in the history books that are tied to any of these experiments, they're always in the Royal Society of London College or yep. some weird secret society in their family. So, uh, yeah, it's probably hard to find them. But, yeah, I'll have to look that video up. But, yeah, dude, I don't know if, like, Come Get Squared would describe it or, you know, the great philosoph- philosophical and insightful ramifications of the E equals MC squared equivalency. I think that would have been a better title. <laughs> <laughs> I look key. Oh yeah, yeah. I like the uh, the philosophical ramifications of getting squared up. <laughs> okay. That's a happy, that's a, the happy compromise.
It's actually cool. That should be the name of the second one. Yeah, I'm changing it right now. <laughs> the the title. Nice. Oh, oops, shit. Yeah, I was very baked for that whole thing. So that was that was great. Me, me too. I yeah. fucking ripped up right before we went live. Yep. <laughs> right. Dude, I was so high I couldn't fi- I couldn't fix my volume on my yeah, on, you, uh, on Dude, I was on very podcast, surprised. Which, which, which I, I know to do immediately. <laughs> yeah, I know how to do it immediately. And I was like, fuck it, abort, abort. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dude, like one thing you're like, ah, just blew up the whole thing. Like what? <laughs> you know, it, it was it unmute. No, fuck it. All right. Fuck it, it is. Yeah, man, I re up my pack squads. Well, this time, uh, yeah, I started it right at the beginning, and I had it like open on my second screen pretty much the whole time to make you know to. So yeah, I I, I was I made sure it was up the whole time, so that was a good nice, good nice, timing. Nice. So I think the previous times I might have started it like a little late or something, but yeah, this one should be like fully covered. There's like probably no interruptions of the of the screen share too and the audio so yeah it should all be clean from beginning to end that's excellent yeah. you're gonna have to steal that and upload it now Al. That's, yep. that's the sole surviving copy of the rendition of oh. what we just did oh bro i take all of them and uh upload them and take geo in them that's nice. your youtube channel is doing nice now huh you're almost over, over a thousand now that was relatively yeah. quick it seems yeah, to be just the other day. You're like, "Hey, I'm gonna start a YouTube," and here it is. It's like seven yep. subscribers. I had like 80 <laughs> subscribers at the beginning of the year, bro. Right. The 80 piece nugget. Your gold crowders are in his eye, by the way. <laughs> Where'd Matthew Learns go? Was he? Was wasn't he in here? Where'd the Globers in here? There were Globers when we started, right? Globers came in and out during the thing. I heard the the dings. I'm just happy oh, that. Learned they had to check back in with the CIA. <laughs> 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 like, like since the think, show was he? I think Ma- <laughs> I think Matthew got bullied out of, of the chat. It looked like yeah, I was like people. People like to bully Matthew. Yeah, it's unfortunate, man, because he's a he's a nice lad. But that good this this was like you got you got to let Matthew Lawrence critique you guys, or you guys are just grandstanding and peacocking. It's like, dude, it was open. We wanted the Globers. I called out the Globers before. I was, I think I commented, boy, I hope they stick around for the end so we can ask questions. <laughs> and then the end came and went, and none of them asked any questions. And what the hell? I was welcoming it, dude. Yeah, you did jump up quick on subscribers, man. Passed me up. I, I went, um, I kind of um, tied the noose myself, man, when I, when I called out and made all the videos with quantum eraser and nathan oakley and junk man like um i lost a lot of subs but man i, I gotta call it how i see it man you know i, I still watch them I'm, uh, it's just the and, ether um, divide dude it's weird that like everyone who's not on the side of the ether is like you know super angry and ornery and has a terrible like negative like a perspective on everything that's a weird like differentiation there's a neutral way to stay to keep them all you know if, if you're if you're, it's just about subs because I, I didn't really lose any because I gained a bunch, but I lost a bunch. And uh, but I mean, I could have just been neutral and, and found and gained a bunch if it was just about subs. But man, I'm I'm going to call people out. I'll call myself out. Shit. If, if I uh, catch myself in something, man, I'm going to call myself out. I've done it before in videos where I had to, man. Just just keeping it real, man. Dude, I think I saw Witsit pop in for like the tail end of your, prank, your, your presentation. I haven't seen him on in a while. Yeah, so I'm on there for a second. I wanted to say what's up after the. Yeah, um, it's like I saw him. Did. And then I like meant to go like talk to him, and I was like, oh, he's gone already. Do you. <clears throat> so, yeah, the Globals are left because they're going to go huddle, review the information, get their dissemination of their script from MC Tune, and come back into the text channels. Uh, yep. 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 Until Tune Till then, you know that it see it works there, dude. It works there. But until then, like, tuned up. yeah, <laughs> dude. Until then, they're like they're either gonna say nothing or they're gonna pull the dogs are gods <laughs> thing and just randomly start diff- like inserting their juxtapositions. Like, uh, uh, uh. Google says stuff. 
I don't know, yeah, but better. Be Chew up, though, man. That come across this and they're like, "Hey, how come you know? Why didn't I learn that?" No, you know, no, no. They don't. They, they don't think that. Not? How come I didn't hear about any of this? Sh- oh, I ain't talking about Matthew or Crochet with them, but you know what I'm saying. People who who are just just feeling it out and seeing what's, you know, they they got to ask the question. Why wasn't I taught this? You know, why didn't I hear about the uh, these conflicting views and these other experiments? You know, because uh, they're getting harder and harder to find. That's why I think Alan's doing a good job of of bringing all this right to the table, man. Throwing it out there, man. It's important work. Bringing Bennett, dude. Bennett. That's like <clears throat> insane, man. And yeah, that was epic, didn't, dude. Didn't, you know what could be also epic is when... With Wang at first? What? Didn't you have a couple email uh, back and forth with Wang, or did he just never respond, period? No, I, I emailed him originally saying, hey, I'm you know, interested in, in your paper. I just wanted to confirm that this is the correct, or that this is like a valid, <laughs> sorry, excuse me one second. Yeah. It's still, you started referencing like the specific center ACI, like in implications. He was like, Oh no, no, never mind." But he was like, yeah, I'm interested in your work and this is cool. He was like, yeah, yeah, oh. that's great. Oh, ECI. No, no, no. I'm not interested. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So, um, so I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm interested in your stuff. I just want to make sure this is a valid email address. And he, he, he emailed me back within like 20 minutes and was like, yeah, super valid. Hit me up, dog. Can't wait to talk to you. It's going to be super cool. Love answering questions or whatever. I'm like, great. So uh, I didn't want to waste the opportunity, right? So I didn't hit him like right away with some dog shit. So I was like, cool, cool. So I'm just, I'm going to like study up now. So I like go in depth, you know? And I come up with something like, I don't want to freak him out. Right. Cause obviously we have wildly different views on cosmology that would affect his career if he got caught, you know, associating with the enemy or whatever. Right. So I was just trying to bring it up casually about um, some questions I had about the ECI reference frame. Cause it always bothered me why they have to transform in the first place. If it's valid in any coordinate system, I mean like, you know, like, well, like what the hell's, what the hell's going on there? And then, so I asked him about that, and then, and then, like before I got to that, I he mentioned in one of his papers that um, that there's like a dispute in the academic community about Einstein, and that like it's high, it's a highly debated um, you know topic on the accuracy of the theories, <clears throat> and that his uh, GPS proposal would settle and stuff. So I asked him about his experience with uh, you know questioning Einstein and like not being an Einstein ear in mainstream in mainstream academia. And like, so those were the two questions that I asked him, like, you know, about the Einstein stuff and how, and like how that was, like if, if it affected his career, did he feel safe, you know, talking shit about your boy or like, what's up? Uh, and, um, and the ECI thing, like, what was the significance of that frame specifically? And he'd never messaged me back. Just instant ghost. That's pretty soft though, man. I mean, you came at him. I mean, his own shit implicates it. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I get it, though. But just no response at all. That's, uh, man, that's a little chicken shit, don't you think? I mean, sci- they act like well, science. No. Yeah, like, like you just write a paper. Look, you, you go go write a paper and get it peer-reviewed and win your Nobel. Man, what the F, dude? These people can't even can't even take a, a slight well, detour down well, that Brian, road before and they're shunned. You asked Possibly, him, like, so he was you asked him, like, oh, do you think that they not know and they just got caught up? And it's like, no, dude, they full well, he full well understands the implications. So that's why when Alan was like, hey, I love your work, ask you some questions, he was like, yeah, enthusiastic, energetic, sure. And then he's like, hey, so about that ECI frame, why do they have to transition the ball cord? Oh, I don't have, uh, I don't want to talk about that. Right? Like, I instantly decided, nope, that's not the conversation I want to have because he's and full well in the implications. In Sorry, man. I was just saying, maybe he didn't want to put those words to paper. If he started discussing that, then it's it's all on official record in a way. It's well, yeah, coming exactly. from his email. Exactly that. Like that's why he was like, "Nope, disengage." Yeah. yeah. Like, what? What if this kid's a flat earther and puts it on his YouTube channel and then like lists my name <laughs> somewhere? You know, like that's probably his exact fear. These new 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 age earthers in their screenshots, man, can't even. Just send a message and delete it real quick. We'd be done screenshot up ah, too late. We got it. You said it. You're owning up to it, motherfucker. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just joking, man. 
email. Oh, dude, dude, Coach shows back. Of task. Anything you say through email is there written down. You you kind of pinned down. It's almost worse than a, a conversation, you know. As far as career wise, if anybody wants to hold shit against you, but, but dude, he, he developed a rapport and everything, you know. Yeah, I, it's just crazy how he just cut it off. One 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 word, not even yeah, three letters, ECI, and bam, cuts off. <laughs> it's all good, man. I hope he lives long and prosperous. I'm glad that he didn't tell me because then it would have been, then I wouldn't have a cool story of figuring it out. It was much more gratifying going through it. And then if you yeah. watch the Witsit stream part two uh, or of the end of field, you can see me figuring it out live like 20 minutes after the conversation. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, is this like, you know, then we have a full discussion about it live and it was awesome. So. Instead of just leaning on Wang, right? Lean, uh, Wang yeah, instead of just instead of just yeah, somebody yeah. gave me the answer, like you know, it's like it was way more fun to go through it. So <laughs> that's what's up. Shout out to Wang Plus, making it hard. Dude, I respect it. Also, to be insta corroborated by like uh, doctorate, PhD, like Bennett, like researcher in the field, like oh yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, it felt good. Yeah, that what was up, an awesome Matthew? presentation. How you been, hey. man? I haven't spoke to you in a while. How you been? I've been doing okay. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, oh, yeah. almost. Nice. Oh, dude, are you uh, you, you, you about to square up with that turkey dog? <laughs> See, I can make it work with anything, bro. What's up? <laughs> Test me. <laughs> next week, yep. Yeah, that's what's up, bro. Did you enjoy the Einstein presentation? Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about that side of things um so i don't feel qualified to respond well to that i don't, no, I don't, I don't, I don't like that answer matthew and like it's like a pivotal like you know foundational understanding and the adaptation of science as you know it for you to it's a foundational belief for your rhetoric and you're like yeah i'm not really interested in that no it's not yeah, I, I mean i can have that foundational belief if, if they heard all this stuff that alan stone you know it, it's gotta have him questioning shit at, at the very well, no. least it's you, you, you need relativity and you need Einstein, you need E equals MC squared, you need all that. No, you don't. They didn't what have you, it in the 1700s. <laughs> what do yeah, you mean you don't? Moving, you do. To keep the earth moving, you absolutely do. No, you don't. In the 1700s, well, did they have that? They didn't have the earth moving. In the 1700s, they did. I don't, yeah, I don't think they thought they were spinning back then. Yeah, they did. Just no. under, uh, study history. What are you talking about? So here's a 1898 paper from your boy uh, Wilhelm Wula, or uh, yeah, Wilhelm Wynn. And uh, what he goes over here is a list of ten experiments that show that there's no, it's either a no conclusive or a falsification of Earth's motion. And uh, you know, so. So did Wilhelm think that uh, the Earth went around the sun, or what did he think? Yeah, despite all the evidence that there isn't that it's not like <laughs> like that's the, that's what's crazy about it, right? Actually, I don't know what Wilhelm believed. I assume he did though. Yeah, I mean, well, this is kind of like a scenario like Hubble talks about, right? Where everything points to the Earth being in the center, but we can't actually have it be that way. So we'll just like figure out some philosophical, uh, you know, standpoint to ensure that the Earth isn't actually in the center of the universe. Yeah, so I, I, you're right about that. I disagree with Hubble. That was a philosophical reason. He says we can't be in the center, and I think we could be. Um, but I, I would say that the solar system is generally near the center, not that the Earth is the very center. Sure, That's sure. That's what so, I was going to say earlier, man. You know, Ever since... Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, What's just your gonna, favorite center? Do you, do you know how they... Like, has there been a measurement of Earth's orbital rotation around the sun? Ever? No, they just they just do calculations. Do you find that interesting, especially when they have we have the technology that is far far beyond what we need as far as accuracy to be able to measure that motion? Uh, yeah. So, what's what's the problem with the uh, with measuring it the way they do? I don't and what interferometers don't measure? That's the problem, right? Like this, the super sensitivity. Right. That they have and do, they go, they go to measure it, right? And then they, they can't, they don't, they feel it's never been measured. Yeah. Right, no, no, no. Matthew. The problem is, you can just say 
well, if we were doing this, then the calculations would be this. Like, that's fantastic to just hypothesize about that. But when you have the actual instrumentation that would be able to measure the mu movement, like, physically and the claims that everything else can be measured physically on its movement, why do we still in 2023, almost 2024, don't have measurements of Earth's orbital motion around the sun? Do you find that interesting? Yeah, that is interesting. I don't know why. <laughs> I could think right. of one. I That's could think I of like one Matthew. reason. I yeah, I could think, think of one, one really good reason. <laughs> oh, that it doesn't exist. Correct. Yeah, the uh, simplest. I think that's the wrong reason. But. but it's the simplest. It's the easiest, right? It's the most logical. Hey, we don't have any measurements because no one's ever measured it. Right? It's an easy logical. Yeah, and to deduction. maintain it, man, we'll start. And to maintain it, we'll throw out everything. We'll start. We'll throw out every experiment. We'll start throwing out ether. We'll start shrinking apparatus. Dude, we'll start expanding <laughs> fucking everything around us. Whatever it takes, <laughs> boy, we just no matter what it shows us, we'll find a way around it. Right, because <laughs> they they have other reasons for thinking it be true so that they come up with excuses to um, figure out why the measurement <laughs> isn't working. Oh. well yeah, no they, they well no they, they don't they just have a belief system in something that's not even like you know uh, that doesn't even adhere to the mathematical framework that they believe in right right well, I mean it's based on a preconceived notion that the earth uh, rotates around the um, sun <clears throat> they definitely come up with excuses that's for sure they do it really well actually come up with all sorts of reasons to keep believing the things that they already believe. Matthew, let me ask you a quick question. Is it even possible, okay, they say that things are moving faster, like light and everything, because of gravity, uh, the higher we get. Is it possible that space is just not expanding as we get further away from the ground? Is it even possible that what's Above me and below me is move, going to move at the same speed, period. It's not covering more ground. So maybe things aren't really moving faster f further up. We're just covering the same amount of ground. Is that even possible? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's definitely possible. What do you mean Fair covering, covering the same ground? So all motion is relative, right? It's like how fast something is moving based on now, what you use as the zero point. Oh, only kinematically. Yeah, that's, it's, I mean, that, that's, that's been yeah. So, and that's really what the crux of the Einstein's theory is. It's kinematics, and it's stitched together with a <clears throat> with an adherence to something called covariance, which gets violated in and of itself to maintain the ability to uh, to to continue calculating under the premise of satisfying conservation laws. So it's like it. it so the, the the big distinction here is like these people say that time physically changes right and it dilates right and that like length actually contracts physically and uh, well so here's where it gets interesting right the high level relativists will tell you that the attraction is is apparent relative to the observer even though that doesn't make any sense because then you would lose the ability to explain mickelson morley if it's not a physical contraction so the high level relativists that forget about mickelson morley and like want to get all big brandon shit will straight contradict themselves and throw out the 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 mandatory physicality of the contraction to explain Mickelson Morley. And so like you'll get contradictions right off the rip with that. Um is it apparent? Is it is it physical? But they need these explanations to explain why there's no motion because they have very precise interferometry experiments that, that show that that they can detect uh, motion like super accurately and the only thing they ever detect is a fluctuation that corresponds to s the motion of the stars go figure it's, yeah and it's like yeah wait it, yeah they and do, within they that do detect the motion of the stars yeah this it, it matches sidereal time the fluctuations so and the, so the earth the the reference frame of the earth and the reference frame of the stars do have a different uh, different reference frame and that is measurable. The stars move over even, the earth and we measure that. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah, yeah. The stars. Think about this. Like if, if something's moving on the ground, uh, let's say 500 miles an hour and then something is above it, um, 500 miles and it's also going 500 miles an hour. Okay. You, you have to say that 
it's moving faster, even though it's directly above me, because on a globe, it's covering more ground. Yeah, so you two, have to two say, miles an hour faster. That's not much. So you have to say that it's moving faster, that things are moving faster, well, and it's the gravity and all this. It, it is, in yeah, that's reality, why we're moving at the same speed. That's why it's all about reference frames, right? Because we're all we're observing motion. That's what this whole thing is about. We're observing the sun, you know, cause sunset and rise and set every day. You guys are ascribing that motion to Earth rotation and claiming to measure it in all sorts of crazy ways. And we're saying, well, actually, every measurement we've ever taken of that rotation coincides directly to not only sidereal time, but peaks and flows, max and mins on the equinox precisely. Precisely known to, like, coincide with the solar minimum and maximum. Like, so... When you say that it's the Earth measuring, moving, and the measurements that you, you're claiming you have to come up with those sorts of crazy interpretations and extrapolations to make it make sense, and we're saying you're measuring the sky, and hey, look, it coincides with the sky, and hey, look, it matches the sky, and hey, look, it coincides with these measurements, wouldn't you think that our <laughs> case is stronger? No, I think it's just all relative. So it doesn't matter. See, me. the danger of E equals MC squared, guys, right there. But more <laughs> of the relativism has seeped into this, so nothing's matter, everything's relative. Jesus. Yep. And here's just, here's the uh, here's the stationary um, lab frame making the only correct prediction on the on how to interpret the speed of light. So there is there is no re dynamic relative motion. It's just a kinematic fantasy um that people have been tricked into believing has physical meaning through lies about experimentation regarding the motion of stars during an eclipse and uh, in the pound repka experiments and shit. Like that's like literally the best explorer or uh, best so-called experimentation for a, a, an interaction with a, uh, that they say that light has an interaction with a so-called gravitational field and, or the curvature of space time. Those are the best experiments they got to like tie it all together and make it real. And it's, and when you look into it, that's not that's not even the case at all like the guys that did the experiment don't even agree with with what with what they got like they, they they weren't able to make a determination between relativistic effects and classical mechanic effects so do the amount of hoops you have to jump through to like scientifically like, justify the nonsense that you have to believe like to like it's to like interpret it that way is insane it's like yeah it's like matthew it's yeah. like you can say yeah that you know all emotions relative or whatever but then it's like you can look into the experimental falsification of that and how the lab frame is the only valid frame and the implication of that is that it's stationary non-moving and the and the only way to interpret the results that we're getting is that the earth is stationary with respect to an ether wind that's 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 basically corresponding to the uh, uh the sidereal rotation right like that's that translation of motion because as you go higher right the readings get stronger Oh man! Yeah, they would that. say if you got an underground wire. Hey, Brian, like Brian, relax, power relax. Power. Let, 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 your, let your boy, if I can, let your boy talk. Well, I, I just, I just hit. Totally I know, but like, but like, we, well, we need to get the other guy with me. Like, you know. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, I would say, um, I don't. I'm sort of uncomfortable with this idea of like um, contraction or time dilation or lots of the the basic assumptions of relativity. So. Um, that, you know, good. I'm suspicious of the whole thing, I guess. And I don't Me understand too, all these <laughs> results you posted. That's, that's, I don't know. No, no you're, good, good, you're good, bro. But like, so that's the other thing of like you and Ruhiv demonstrate. Like, you're like, yeah, I'm comfortable with all the heliocentric positions and belief in philosophy. And like that cornerstone of relativity, I don't need that. I don't care about that. I don't care about that. I don't need to know about it. You tell me it's wrong doesn't have any effect on me. That's a weird position because well, that's, literally, that's the way that everybody thought in the but no, I know. 16, That's... 17, 1800. So, you know, I'm with 400 years worth of scientists saying that. Well, so Einstein, like, that, the relativity bailed that whole out, right? That's that's the whole point. That's the danger of ego. That's what we were talking about tonight. That's the whole tie-in. Yeah, so if Einstein was wrong, we just go back to 400 years ago and, you know, all the same things, all the same proofs for the globe still hold. What 400-year-old proofs of the globe are there? Uh, just the, the the relative motion of the planets and the stars and uh, explanations mm. of eclipses and moon yeah, phases in the sky and, oh. and we make N predictions N based on the on. motions on. of the sky things. If <laughs> Einstein's theory are falsified, though, then there's no relative motion, and the only way to interpret all of the events you just listed is from a geocentric stationary position. Oh, that's so, like, the so, only way. So, so, 
Yeah, well, no, no, it is. No, the old, no, the only way. 100%. No, that's not true. It, it's all relative yeah. about. So you, no. I'm talking about relativity in respect to uh, measuring motion, not like, not like Einsteinian relativity. No. So the the dis- <laughs> the distinction though is that they've told people that they've that their equations have physical meaning, dog. Yeah, they're saying they time bends and that. stops. Yeah, that seems weird to me. I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> That's good. That's like because you're a rational human, right? That that smells fishy, so to speak. That's because it's complete and utter bullshit, man. It's fine. It should it should smell funny to you. But all of this is just about um, the motion of the Earth. It doesn't say anything about the shape, right? It's about the motion, right? And you're incorrectly attributing that motion to the Earth against all signs, measures, experiments, logical deductions, invisible evidence that we have. You guys have attributed that motion to the Earth. And we've attributed it to the sky properly as it coincides again with not only sidereal time, but effects in the sky and then peaks right at the equinox and the solstice. So if that isn't evidence that what you're actually measuring is the motion of the sky, I don't know what it is. Dude. Yeah. So the point is that all of this is about motion, not about shape, right? I agree. That everything that I put forward tonight wasn't about the shape of the earth. It was about motion. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. No, wait, was that it, Matthew? Was that, was that your whole so, statement? Yeah, I mean, but that you, you, even if you're right, the worst I'd have to do is go back to the geocentric model. Right. Well, that's cool. It starts. Well, well, yeah, step we, one, we'll start bro. There. Step one, bro. Yeah, like I said, like we'll take it, bro. Like, well, you know, come what I'm on board, Matthew. Come on home in the heat. Let, let's go. <laughs> like that, let's go be the modular one, geocentrists together. We'll, we'll give you the shape of the globe and we can be <laughs> geocentric for a while. <laughs> well, yeah. So to be fair, um, I, I'm not actually going to become a geocentrist. I, I just, uh, I know, I know what the, what the people say. I can't defend um, all of these right. things you're saying. I can't defend, defend relativity. Well, you know, yeah. believe it. you know, Matthew, it's not only you that can't defend it. It turns out nobody can defend it because it's, it's retarded and wrong. But I'm just trying to attack the belief that that actually, like, you don't need relativity. It's not important. Even if it is wrong, like, I can still have black holes and uh, theoretical physics and uh, bending of warping of space-time and all the derivations of the modern society that come from that. You think that all that just comes with it, but, you know, the basis behind it doesn't matter and it would never... Like, I don't, I don't understand that, man. Uh, all I'm saying is that everything that was presented today would have not deterred Newton. Because he, you know, he didn't think that Einstein... Newton believed in ether. Yeah, he, Newton it believed in uh, gravitation part of his, as a... He, oh, he believed in it, 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 it as a pressure... He in it, yeah, that's he believed true. in it yeah, as a he, pressure mediation. Yeah, that's right. He, he didn't like action at a distance, so he thought there was some kind of ether. That's true. I mean, oh, even okay. Einstein says that he doesn't... He can't imagine space without an ether like you just can't work out the dynamics without having an ether (laughs) like seriously even einstein understood that wait you can't just stop at geocentrism though y'all because just real quick if you thought yeah let him stop stop. if we we could get matthew to be a geocentrist like i'll take it you know what i'm saying like like that'd be hilarious (laughs) yeah but he's got to but like in a good way you know good stuff i'm with you (laughs) But you, you still, there's logical conclusions. Like if you got a wire underground going uh, a thousand miles of the country, and then a wire above ground, and uh, you have to, b- because they got to the, from beginning to end at the same time, uh, you have to say that time slowed down for the one uh, underground. Like, dude, relativity is, explains the fact that shit's moving at the same rate, so it doesn't just stop. I mean, that's just one little quick example. It, it, it crumbles like a house of cards. The globe does. What you, what, well, yeah, we should just get him on geocentrism first. I see what you're saying. Well, dude, it's it's cool that he's questioning. Like, hey, this this thing sounds wacky. This this time dilation seems a little bit not like because that's true. That's all valid. Let's use that. Let's go with your natural instincts and your intuition, Matthew. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So I'm not going to become a geocentrist. I I have a high level of trust in people who understand this better than I do. So I I think that. I know you say that I don't have good answers for that, and I don't, but I think that some people do. But they don't. Nobody well, does. Well, you, well, you know what's them. cool, though, is like if you try to like learn it, some of it and interpret it yourself and then ask them so that you're not so reliant on their interpretations, 
because I was actually I made the mistake of like heavily relying relying on someone that has you know academic credentials, and I would just like I would I would like front load some relativity stuff to him and just be like, "Yo, does this debunk your religion?" And he'd be like, "No, of course not." And I'm like, "Oh, dang," you know. And it's like I really had to like look into it my for myself, you know what I mean, and like figure it out. And then it was like, it's not everything the way that they interpret it is wrong and experimentally shown to like invalidate their position. And when you confront them about it, they're just like, you think you can question Einstein, you think blah, blah, blah. And it gets like very religious, right? Like, it's like, you know, if you take like when it, when it devolves into that, it's no longer argumentation about like the logistics of the situation. It's about your adherence to the correctness of Einstein, irrespective of, you know, reality. And that's that's like seeing that it's like you can ask them all kinds of stuff about this and the chance like, you know, you're rolling the dice on whether or not they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that Wang experiment actually is super damning. Like, I need to look more into this. They're just going to be like, nah, all he did was a mathematical trick. It's all good. It's like, what? You know, so a mathematical ju- 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 transform. Yeah, ju- all the world yeah, just something. Yeah, just something to consider, bro. Because uh, I used to, you know, believe in that stuff too, man. And give yeah. all my adherence to it. Yeah, and so um, that's why when people ask me why I think that the Earth is not flat, I don't bring up these kinds of things that I don't understand as evidence um, against the flat Earth because I don't understand it well enough. Like, But you don't believe us when we say it's actually not evidence for you at all. That's why we keep talking about it and giving each other presentations on it, right? <laughs> no, I'm talking... Yeah, that's why I'm saying that this stuff about motion and ether and relativity is not something that I usually bring up in this in this uh, argument because I don't understand. Do you, do you think it's important? Oh, probably so. Okay. Okay, but like, so... I mean, I guess it would be safer, like, if I was you, and if I was a, a believer heliocentrist trying to maintain my law, I, w- I would probably not look into it, even though I suspected it didn't sit right with me, it sounded a little goofy. Like, I probably would just assume that smarter people than me figured it out and everything was fine, rather than have to challenge my own belief system. I think that's probably what I would do. Yeah, but to me, it seems like these things are on the fringe edges of the theory. Like, the basic idea that the Earth is a globe and that the... Uh, sun and moon are where they appear to be are kind of more basic things that that normal people can look into like i'm not going to do infraterometry uh light speed relativity experience experiments so i stick to the easier stuff i guess <laughs> the easier stuff yeah like sunsets yeah yes. well i guess it's it's more in regards to the nature of the realm and reality itself right it's like what have they told us about the existence and our place in it because it's a total facade that's backed up by abstract mathematics used to keep you in a system of belief about the nature of the things in the sky. Right. And, and, and to control your interpretation of what they are, like, you know how freeing it is to like, not know what they are. And to, 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 to be like, to <laughs> look up there, to like, with to, to, yeah. To like, yeah. To just look up there and be like, what the hell are you? And it's not, it's not, Oh, it's a ball of gas, nuclear reaction, fusion and or fusion. Uh, fission depending on your belief system and it's like oh okay dude but like that's not yeah dude i like realize that when you really yeah it is liberating because he's always like yeah that makes sense you're like hey isn't it weird that we've sorry dude oh i was just gonna say it's liberating to not know anything about what makes the sun go yeah twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are the song for the beginning of time bro and uh Go take a little star. Like, here, if you ask when you, you like, yeah, <laughs> when you because when you look into the interpretation of how they say it, it works, it's like, oh well, that's not it at all. Like they fired their that that guy Eric Dollar got his whole career ruined over uh you know talking about how the sun isn't a uh, nuclear fusion reaction and all that shit. Um, and he was like talking about how it was like electric energy from another dimension, basically. And he has all these um experiments and and uh what's it called like uh what do you call it like working technology or whatever that works off of uh you know the uh, ether and stuff so it's like is that guy crazy or is it or, he, or did he figure out that like what they said about it isn't 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 real what do you think? But like 
but like we we were talking about motion, like oh, isn't it weird that we've never detected Earth's orbital velocity? And Matthew's like, yeah, that is a little weird. But well, we, his first reaction was, well, we've calculated it. And yeah, Napalm calculations are good enough for me. And, and Napalm pressed him a little bit. He's like, yeah, sure, but have we ever measured it? No. Well, isn't it weird? Well, no. Well, how come it's not weird when we have the instruments with the severity and the degree of sensitivity well beyond the threshold to require to measure such a tremendous motion? Yeah, no motion has ever been detected. And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess that is weird. And onward we moved. But then we went right to relativity, which was decimated. And now he's like, well, I don't really like to defend it with that because I don't want to stand it. But, yeah, it probably is important, yet I don't, I, don't, I don't want to defend it. And it sounds goofy. Is that about where we're at, Matthew? Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Hell yeah, brother. That's that's like what's we made up. progress. Yeah, hell yeah. I, I mean, I usually stick to debunking the flat earth and not talking about proofs, uh, not talking about these things about the globe. Um, you know, proofs for the globe, I think, are hard to come by. Proofs for the globe, hard to come by. Yeah, extremely hard. But yeah, I would call evidence. And especially like the alternative being flat, um, there's evidence that that can't be right. Go on. Oh, uh, let's see. Full moon. Um, it, it, see, it appears the same size from all places on Earth, or within one percent um, from everywhere on Earth. Yeah, it's at different angles. So, if it's a physical object, it's hard to explain if the Earth is flat. Oh well, let's just make it not a physical object. Yeah, I mean, we can deny what we see with our eyes and call it just some other thing if you like, and that's probably <laughs> the best the best option you got. Well, I think we got pretty good observable evidence for it acting more like a rainbow and a source projection just like the sun as opposed to any other solid object and probably more evidence to the contrary with things being like photographed through the moon and it's weird different coloration going with the background that it's in depending on the which you know layer of ionizing gas it happens to be in right you got the things like the super moon and thing so i don't know i think it goes both ways no, you just look at the well, moon. Just how, get a, pair of te te a telescope or a pair of binoculars, and you can see that it's a physical object. I got a question. How do you uh, think the the prediction from the globe fits so nicely when you account for the parallax of the moon, for example? Like, if you're, hmm. if you're trying to determine the path of totality of a, of a solar eclipse, the globe's pretty much spot on. That would be really weird if the Earth wasn't a globe. Dude, he said parallax. Get him, Alan. Dude, he said a couple lunar. of things. He said parallax <laughs> and lunar shadows, and I tapped out because it's not really related. So, you want but geocentric predictions? You, but actually, this doesn't uh, distinguish between geocentric or heliocentric. It distinguishes between a flat Earth and a globe Earth. Because you're definitely using a globe if you want to get the totality path right. And that does require you to take into account the parallax of the moon. Because the moon's a lot closer than the sun is. If you don't take into account the parallax of the moon, you get the wrong answer. Go through the parallax of the moon situation. Is that the correction where the half rotation of the Earth, so called, and all that stuff? Is that what you're talking about? It's not related to rotation of the Earth, no. It's related to how high the moon appears in the sky given your distance to its ground position. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the corrections that you're talking about for the for the predictions. I'm familiar with the Fred Espernak story and the and how they talk about um, it's something to do with the only. It's similar to what you're saying, but they say that the only way that the prediction matches is because the Earth's a globe, and they have to basically subtract three days from the prediction and then rotate the globe a quarter and a half times or something or something like that. And it's uh, like that's the way that they. That's the way that they talk about it. So unless you're talking about that, I'm not familiar with any sort of moon parallax. Uh, yeah, I'm not predicting where the celestial bodies are going to be in the sense No, the that, shadow. Yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, like the right. shadow is going to be determined by based on the relative position from the ground. So yeah. you're in the shadow of the eclipse if the, the, front of the moon is in front of the sun, right? If it's not, then you're not uh, exactly in the shadow of the eclipse. It's not going to be as dark. And you're not going to be in the totality path, right? So you're saying those predictions it, can't be made on a flat Earth, though, or is like, Uh maybe I challenge that. I would love to see that, but I know they can't be done on a globe, and on a the globe they're spot on. 
Well, at this point, it would be a post-diction on both sides because all the data derived is already available through the service cycle stuff. So False, because how, how I it, did the prediction myself on, without man. using that data. Go on. You got you got them changing the distance to the sun to three million or hundred two million oh, miles. Yo, Brian, relax, bro. Clips, you know. Me and it's, Duda were just like talking. And, bro. Say that again. No, there are we? problems, bro. You're acting like it's all spot on. There are definitely problems that that uh, are given different explanations. Explanations, not not even bringing up the selenium. We're not talking about giving explanation. We're talking about predicting where the shell is going to be based on the ground position of those two bodies. I know if you use the globe to do that, it's spot on because I did that. I highly doubt you can do it any other way. Bit. Check the timing and how long. Uh, it no, it's reverse it. It's it's post dicted. Dict it's post dicted, right? It's. So it, of course, it's going to work out on the globe because everything's transformed, so they can make sure that it matches their post dictions. There's nothing predictable like about what? the globe, bro. Like what? Well, what? What information? Am well, I if they know what they need, right? They have the exact observations and they fit it to a globe. Was that's not proof of a globe? Just hey, what information? I think what information? I think I used to get the prediction that was uh, like uh, reverse engineered by whoever you're talking about. How how did they do it then? You explain. No, I'm, I I know how I did. Okay, explain and, how uh, you did. I'm talking about my prediction. All I did was I took the ground position of the moon and sun, and then I uh, positioned them as if Earth was a sphere, and they were at the distances of the heliocentric model. And I got what position on the globe would align those two bodies and get the shadow, uh, you get a totality path, and when. And that prediction was spot on with time and date, and well, still are you? But so, Bacon, if you had the position already, couldn't you back sure engineer data. the distance to make that work? What's what your mean? data? Which distance? Scale Which invariance. Is, like, I mean, like, exactly. There's a scale invariant relationship between the variables of distance. Of, like, so when you know where it's going to happen, then you can backwards derive where the object should be to have it seen at that location, right? What 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 data exactly do you think it's being backward engineered? I mean, well, I, I um, use very little amount of information. I'm, I'm arguing. Amount. I'm arguing the distance can be backward engineered. So, what? What? Uh, what? I wasn't what, using any distance. What data? Did oh, you, I mean, yeah. you did. You, sorry, you mean the you distance the, in celestial bodies? Yeah. You said the distance based on the parallax. Right, right. No, yeah, no, so, that yeah, that I use, yeah, right. Right. Well, uh, yeah, I got, yeah, I got from the almanac. The nautical almanac has uh, that data there. Yeah, and the almanac gets data from guess guess where? Observation. <laughs> Dude, do you guys want the to same place NASA get it from? <laughs> no, I mean you can you can challenge any of the data which in the is, almanac, get a sex and old, prove it wrong if it's wrong. It's the old metonic cycle, though. It's just observational data. Yeah, you prove it wrong. Like it's you you use exactly, the same observational exactly. so, data. So if it's projected. observational data, then I'm I'm not a backward engineering anything. I'm just using data we can all agree is correct. So how well, how is that I'm using yeah, data? Yeah, hang on. on a second. Let me just <laughs> let me just finish my not, so, let me so just finish my sentence, please. Almanac. Hold on. Can, can I? To me. Well, I was in the middle. I was mid sentence. Why let, let, him finish, let, him finish, let him finish real quick. Go ahead, Bacon. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So I'm using data that we all agree is observable. Uh, it's not backward engineering for me. It's just data we can all observe and okay. confirm. And what I'm predicting is not part of that data. What I'm predicting is something else that is derived from the data that is observable. Cool. Okay. So within the data set, where does it explain distances to these objects? It doesn't. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to know. Yeah, that's something that depends on how you are interpreting the data. If you interpret it as a flat Earth, you're going to get one answer. If you want to interpret it in a globe, you get the right one. <laughs> yeah, you're not uh, at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, show Alan, Alan, show how you say, how you're gonna. You gonna show something. Yeah, the almanac. I'm looking for uh, where I have it saved. So it's like, um, where was it in 1776? There was a royal decree by whoever the king was at the time, and basically what he said was, 
hey, we're rolling out a new longitude coordinate system and any map that comes out that doesn't adhere to this is now illegal. And then under that, he has a bounty for, or like a, like a rewards program for uh, people to go out and do observations where they do celestial navigation around Britain and they uh, come up with the coordinates or they come up with a way to match the coordinate system so that two observations can navigate around Britain. Um, so basically they were coming up with the 3959 you know, radius and all that sort of stuff for the globular coordinate system and, and matching it to what they were um, already derived for like the, the quote unquote sphere, right. To make everything well, fit. So, so when you get into the distances assumed, there's a scale invariance there that's going to be proportional to where they had to move everything to say that, Oh, it's because we're on a globe that you could see it at this angle. Cause it's at this distance, blah, 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 even though it's all based on angular size when it was derived. Um, right. Completely. So, from your source. I'm not sure how that. Sorry, so I thought you're Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah. I think like what I what brought here wasn't addressed because uh, still the data I can, I can post the data used. I I know how to interpret that data as if uh, we're on a heliocentric model, and I can tell what the shadows are going to be based on that very minimal amount of data that we can all. Uh, mm -hmm. Like it's just observable data, mm -hmm. and then your guys are all free to reinterpret that data as a flat Earth. Like, uh, okay, let's say Earth is flat, and we have that same observational data. How we're going to interpret that to get where the shadow is going to be, where the totality path is going to be, and when it's going to be? I just you're, you're free to do I that. If you get the right answer, Sorry. then kudos to you. But I don't think that has it has been done. Go ahead, Brian. You're acting like it's perfect, okay? I just posted Nico. three videos of how your shit is most certainly not perfect, and I didn't even throw in the selenium yet. So just check out, just browse through them if you want to see the problems. You're, the, the sun and moon angles are not perfect by no means, bro. You can act like they are, but they are most certainly not, bro. There are problems with the, the time of the eclipses, some of them, with the... Uh, with the angles and and dude, they put the, they've had to move the sun further out. I know you've heard of that, whether you want to look into it or not. I know you've heard it several times where they literally had to move the sun further away just because of the 2017 eclipse, and they're getting different results with different eclipses and shit. So something's wrong. Maybe some of these distances are off a little bit. Maybe the angles are off a little bit. But uh, you act like your model's perfect, bro. It's not perfect, bro. I don't even know why you say that. I didn't say I didn't say it's perfect. I said that my prediction match was brought on to time and date and to Stellarium, which is the kind of software that like photographers use when they get when I get uh, uh, a photo of uh, the solar eclipse. Like they 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 have to know exactly when it's gonna happen, when they have to aim, uh, if they want to get it right. Uh, and they use this kind of softwares and they, they're able to do it. So I think those softwares are spot on. And my prediction are we're spot on to these softwares. But it doesn't have to be perfect, but within a practicality, it's pretty much spot on. I'm not saying there's, a, there's, any, there's not any observation that doesn't match it. There might very well be. But the one I'm bringing here, I don't see any way Flutter Earth can get the same prediction. And I'm open to anyone that proposes a a father's prediction for that. Also, the zero, the zero cycles um, don't um, predict whether it's going to be an annular eclipse or a total eclipse. There's no it, it, you're talking about a, uh, yeah, there's other things that predict that inside of the, it all comes from the zero cycle, okay? And then you could adapt it to your model, but you're talking about a, a degree change between where I'm at in Florida and all the way to Cleveland and the, the Great Lakes in Ohio. And uh, you're talking about a not even a third of a degree in some of these things. I mean, I'd like to see. I mean, did you literally take the angles, or did you at the uh, data available data? Because when it starts I'm getting within sure a half a degree, me. man, I think I think that's worth looking into. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. When it when it starts getting close, because the the differences are not very big between the two models. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, but I'll post <laughs> the data that I used. You might be surprised that it, it was a very little amount of information. You actually can remove, let me see, one, four of those lines, and it's still going to work very very well. It's going to be slightly bad, well, worse, but it's still going to be pretty much spot on, even if you remove four of those lines. 
Maybe six. <clears throat> but anyway, I, that's no. the data. I mean, you have the data directly from uh, the Almanac, which is, as I think we both agreed, it's observable data. And you have two variables, only two variables, uh, Earth radius and sun distance, which it's just the standard of the heliocentric model, the averages of the heliocentric model. I didn't have to reverse engineer anything. Unless you think you can tweak two variables and get every single solar eclipse right by just tweaking two variables. I don't think that makes a lot of I mean, sense. I, lo I, I showed on one of my videos where I dated all the way back to the 80, to 1980, and showed these uh, declinations and um, and freaking in the what you call it, not even changing. Like they change once or twice and then change back. Like and and it's like you you got a 50 years of past and there's no change in the freaking in the motion of, of these bodies, like the stars and all that stuff. And it's like, it, we're supposed to be moving. And I know that there, the stars in your model are way, way far away, but if, uh, no motion over 50 years, I and mean, it's supposed to be like, uh, like a third of a degree or something every 25 years or some shit. It's, I mean, it, but I showed in my video uh, and I didn't just claim it. I showed the almanac, the nautical almanac, and showed the declination year after year after year. I'd skip five years and show where they ain't changing shit. Like people are claiming all these changes, they, and they just ain't happening. According to the almanac, you're saying anyway. the, the 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 start date in the almanac is not changing. Yeah, let me post a video. You just have to watch the very beginning of it when you get a minute. I don't have to. I already looked into the almanacs. You, they change in the, within the same year. What are you talking about? No. I'm talking about within respect of each other. Ah, all right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Proper motion is much, much slower than the... Like, the, the most most of the angular change in stars is uh, attributed to the... Uh, yep. How do you call it? The precessional equinox. I'll show you where the declination didn't change with with any of these stars over fifty years, dude. The declination didn't change even even a a tenth. Let me yeah, I wouldn't this. expect a tenth of a degree with with fifty years because now we're talking about proper motion, not not no uh, no no, not the no no no. I, I'm talking about yeah around the around the circle, the, but I mean the the declination uh, that's different. The declination have the declination does change. Of course, it might not sure. reach. Uh, a tenth of a degree in, ten, in 50 years, but it it reaches a measurable amount because the almanac uh, only measures uh, to a tenth of an arc minute. I don't think you're hearing me. I'm telling you it didn't change at all. Let me show it, man. Let me just quit saying it and sure. just show it. Sure. Yeah, there might be one or two started didn't change, I guess, but I mean, most of them, they from January to December, they change within the same year. Also showed in my celestial nav videos how the, the time zones are so fucking wonky. I just went along one latitude and went where it was negative one, negative one, negative one. Could jump to zero, right? And then positive one, positive one, positive one, and then positive two, positive two, positive three. Okay, it went from negative one to positive one, back down to zero, then to positive one to two. I'm like, dude, if I'm gonna make a model like this where I could just throw time zones wherever the hell I want, then dude, I could make any model work if I'm just. Hey, you're frustrating me, bro. Because I well, you, brought an I argument. Watching videos, bro. Okay, I brought an argument. It didn't get addressed, and now we're talking about something else. That's a bit frustrating. Where is Shane? Well, I'm just going <laughs> off the fact that you like mind. the model work, it works so good, and I'm telling you, I've found so many problems, dude. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, but, time uh, zones are set by political boundaries. They're not part of uh, you know the, the structure of the universe, so to speak. Yeah, but if you're going to refer to the UTC to get your to get your position, your GP, then then you're gonna then you've got issues. Why? Why? UTC is universal. Exactly. If so I say if I'm at, if, if, exactly, so if I'm if I'm at two negative two UTC, and I'm really at negative one, the, the fact that it's universal means shit should be consistent throughout, uh, and I'm subtracting the wrong amount of time from the universal.
UTC. Yeah, but no, the when you say I'm same. eating a video, man, about cell lab bacon. No matter yeah, where you are on you Earth, see, UTC is the same time. Yeah, if you say I'm in minus one or minus two, if you're talking about you're in as you're within the boundary, uh, then now you're talking about the political decision of where they're going to use those uh, time zones. You're not talking about UTC anymore. You're talking about the arbitrary boundaries of where each time zone is going to be used. But if two people have, let's say, if you, if you say, let's call each other at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, I don't know, uh, November 20th of 2023, everyone is going to know do it exactly at the same time. 3 o'clock UTC. Yeah, 3 o'clock UTC, yeah. No one's going to disagree. No, no one's going to get it late uh, to that call. Everyone's going to be on the same time. Doesn't matter where they are, because you're asking, you're you're specifying the time zone. And UTC is just the universal one, the standard one. If you're talking about where you are, based on where those time zones are being used, now you're talking about political boundaries, as Matthew just said. We're not talking about something that is universal. We're talking about something that is arbitrary. Which uh, tells you nothing about the ship there. Did you know that uh, Witsit used to say that there was a problem, there's too many time zones in the southern hemisphere versus the northern? Yes, and I was very impressed that Witsit used that argument. Because I thought he only used uh, the better ones. Right, no, that, I thought that was interesting. I haven't heard him say it lately, so he must have figured out that it was wrong. So Matthew learns, the, um, the picture that you posted of the sun rays, the caprosculo rays, and then you're claiming yes. that they're all parallel and using the example of the train tracks. If we I, were to get I'm those... I'm saying it's consistent. Tracks, it's not evidence one way or another. It's just saying that it, it, there's nothing inconsistent with them being parallel. I'll put it that way. Well, if we were to get those train tracks and let's say we were to put them 90 degrees to each other, they would still end up pointing at the same place. But would the two sets of train tracks 90 degrees to each other be parallel? He actually just addressed it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it and, is, and, and he did. And um, you remember when every Glover I've ever met said you could stand on a beach and watch a boat go over a curve of water? Yes. If you want to dig on somebody, yeah. Maybe, maybe I, wait till it's here to defend himself. Yeah, you still say that. You see a boat going over a curve of water, or that's how we see in the distance. Well, you, you'd have to use binoculars or a telescope, but um, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. what happens. Yeah, every glober says that, that that's the curve of Earth, of what, right. that's, that's what that's you're what, seeing. Yeah, that's what Right, happens. that it can't happen in any other way, that it's the physical curve of water. Right, that's what you stand by, right? Right. Pretty so clear they're still saying it. it. Yep, still true. Wow, that's nice. So then you're saying that the horizon is where the Earth goes? <laughs> no, it's an apparent place. He has to say that, right? But he's just going to turn around and double speak and say it's a physical place where the boat's being obstructed bottom up by the physical water. And act smart. And then talk about somebody that's not here. Which is also dumb. Pointless. Wait, who is that? Who is that it's, talking about who's not here? Witsit. Witsit's not here. Oh, yeah. He made sorry a about that. pointless dig at him. That's why I made a big <laughs> Yeah, Glover. no, you're right about that. I did. He right. was kind of a, Thank no, you. I won't, I won't say you. anything more about him. Thank yeah. you. So you still say that the, the blockage of the bottom of the boat is still a physical place of the water curving? Perspective <laughs> makes things get smaller. It I didn't never say makes perspective. Things... I didn't say perspective. I said, do you think that the obstruction of the bottom of the boat is a physical place of the water curving? Never mentioned perspective. Nice try, though. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a place. I would just call it um, blocking the bottom of the boat. So perspective. I mean, the horizon make things... isn't a place where the ground meets the water. I mean, it's the a... sky meets the water. Well, that's a description of an apparent place. So yes, it apparently looks like the sun or the the, the sky meets the uh, the water. That's the apparent so not place. physical, not a physical curve of water that's obstructing the bottom of a boat. It's just physical the apparent and apparent. Person. It's physical and apparent. Right. Never heard that one. That's that's how everything we look at is. You look at a house, you look at a car, it's physical and apparent. So the horizon is a physical and apparent obstruction. 
No, it's a physical obstruction blocking the bottom of the sun halfway through a sunset. And it's also an apparent... That's not even true. No? I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's not even true in your model. Have you ever seen a the sun set over water? Like I've over seen water? plenty of sunsets. What, ha- what does that have to do with your model? What you're saying doesn't match your model. Your model says that it's already set more than half. Right. And so the location and time are off by a little bit, but I'm saying you can't see the bottom of the sun, but you can a see a little bit. Yeah. Who says you wouldn't be able to see the bottom of the sun? That's the whole point. It's closer to you. What? The bottom of the sun is closer to you on a flat earth than the top of the sun. Yeah. But at certain distances, it doesn't matter if it's a fraction of an inch closer to you, it's still going to be obstructed by the other things that aren't physical. Like how we see over distance or through thicker layers of atmosphere. I think someone said that earlier. I should have screenshot it. Interesting. Interesting. That was a Glover saying no, that. I'm saying interesting. Your your incredulity, but that's okay. No, the interesting part is how you appear to make yourself as the smart one and then contradict everything that you say. I'm glad we got past the Witsit thing. I'll, I'll let y'all continue. You know, Winston never talked about, he said that he knows the, you know, time zones are man-made and blah, blah, blah. But he just said that, you know, on a flat earth model, the South would be bigger, right? And that, you know, the 30, whatever in the South and the 19 in the North, you know, kind of does indicate that, you know, he he didn't make it as if like, you know, obviously, you know, they'll just say that it's man-made. I don't think he was like whatever <laughs> misconstrued that's all i'm point- pointing out oh, what's your what you do with that i just want to clarify that Well, I'm just saying that I think that that saying that he was claiming that is kind of misconstru- misconstruing what he was saying. Like, it's sorry, like right? than just, oh, there's, you know, more in the South than in the North. Like, that wasn't what he was, that wasn't what he was pointing to. Um, I'm asking Bacon and that. I just want to get clarification from uh, Bacon or Matthew that the horizon is where the Earth goes. Horizon is where the... Uh the ground appears to meet the sky and that is caused by earth curve. So it's, it's a physical obstruction, but we see it in an apparent manner. And so when the sun is setting like at 21 past 